Welcome to the 2021 Free UK Genealogy Conference. Or, as we are repeating this presentation at the beginning and end of both sessions, I hope you have enjoyed the 2021 conference. A welcome and thank you to everyone who has volunteered with Free UK Genealogy, as transcribers, as designers, developers and in leading the projects, as trustees and the advisory board members, and as our partners, especially the speakers who are making the conference possible. A hello to those of you who already volunteer with us, and hello to everyone else. You would be very welcome to join the other volunteers. Thank you also to those who have contributed to our running costs. This graph shows how this funding has increased over the last two years. A little about what's been happening in our three projects. In Free BMD, we're now transcribing the GRO indices of births, marriages and deaths in the period 1986 to 1990. The designs for a new interface for users have gone through several iterations and we have volunteers who will be testing in the next few weeks. In FreeSEN, tasks have included building replacements for all the tools for transcribers and coordinators, including the quality control roles of proofreaders and validators. We are working on improving how the censuses can be searched by place and building a gazetteer that helps identify the place in birth intended or finding that it may be ambiguous. We've made changes to our font and colours, both here on Free Sen and on the other sites, and other changes to improve accessibility. Tasks finished on Free Reg include setting up a team to liaise with record offices, moving to input from a spreadsheet that can accommodate many more types of records, improving the use of the uncertain character format, which we use to indicate the level of certainty with which we can see something or nothing in the transcriptions, recording and using data permissions, for example, to automate the showing of records when they age out of an embargo, and recording and reporting gaps in the sequence of registers. How you can help us keep history free? Please consider joining us as a volunteer if you don't already volunteer. Please tell other family historians that we are here. Please put us in touch with anyone we should be talking with. Please consider making a donation to our work. I'd like to thank Denise Colbert, the Engagement and Volunteering Coordinator, and her team who have made this conference possible, alongside much else they do to keep the organisation going. Enjoy the conference and all that Free UK Genealogy brings you. Back to you, Denise. Thank you, Pat, for that. Um... And we're a couple of minutes out before the, um, the beginning of the, the conference at 4 p.m. So, and I don't want really to, to start too early and, and preclude anybody from joining us. Um, but I'm going to start my introduction very shortly. Just wanted to give this opportunity to um, say to anybody who thinks that they should be a co-host. So any trustees that have joined us in the last few minutes um, any speakers I think we're only one speaker down at the moment and that's um, Sarah speaker number two in the program um, I hope that she can join us but no worries if not because all of the presentations are pre-recorded and are going to be um, shared by myself so um, who have we got yeah so so Mary Allen is asking for us if ask, asking if the speakers could enable their video um I'm sure the speakers will enable their video um a when they're at their device they may have just nipped away 
briefly. Um, B, when the presentation is happening, and almost certainly C, when we are asking them questions after their presentation has been shown. And I can see Abby's response to our weather, uh, the weather in Miami, Florida being better than ours. Not difficult at the moment. Happy to say the motorbikes must have gone for their dinner. Doesn't seem to be very noisy at the, here right now. Um, how do I turn off subtitles? If you go to um, more, maybe on the toolbar, Judith, you should have an option for live transcript settings. Um, or you might have a CC live transcript button, which is the way it shows on my screen, on my other screen. And you should be able to turn them off from there. They're a little bit distracting, aren't they? Especially when they get my um, accent muddled. Thanks, Michelle, for that. I didn't mention people from the advisory board. If you'd like to be um, made a co-host, you may want to chip in on, on our panel discussion towards the end of the conference today. So Ben, you're on our advisory board, Ben Brumfield, give us a, a nod or a wave or a message to say that you'd like to um, be made a co-host so you can be identified in the panel. And if there's an, any other members of the advisory board that I've missed, trustees, um, then again, go ahead and let me, let me know. Um, okay, I'll add you, Ben. Uh, Judith, I've I turned off everybody's video as default, but you should have the ability to turn it on. Um, I will make sure that I haven't inadvertently turned you off as well. Judith Young. I don't have the ability to um, start your video, but I can ask you to start it if that would help. Let me, let me do that and see if that helps. Okay, so we're on four o'clock. We've now got 91 participants. And this is the last call for any trustees, speakers, advisory board members volunteers, people who want to be made a co-host, so that when we have the panel discussion later on, you can be identified and um, answer questions that you either are directed or you feel that you have something to say for. Okay. Um, I will start with the introduction then. So welcome to our online conference on open global genealogy. As Pat said, this is our first online conference. So please and thank you for bearing with us while we uh, navigate this potentially steep learning curve. I'm gonna go through a little bit of housekeeping now. Um, I did send some of this in the email with the information on how to access. But just to repeat, please keep your mic on mute unless you're speaking to the group. Um, hosts and co-hosts have the ability to mute your mic, so please don't be offended if you do that, just to keep the um, background noise level down. Bear in mind that this is being recorded so that we can let people um, join us after the event when it suits them. Um, so just bear that in mind when, if you're showing your camera, if your mic is, is not muted um, and the chat, as we've seen, people are found it nicely. Everybody's using it. And um, it's just a request to put any questions for the speakers in the chat. If you raise your hand, we may not see it. We may not notice. We don't want anybody to miss asking a question. Um, so please do put it in the chat. Chat will be disabled. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, during the presentations, just to, to keep everybody 
focused on the video and um, to save distraction. But it will be turned on again by our wonderful moderators um, in time for the questions and answers. After each presentation, we're going to have a little poll about each um, topic that we've seen, and then you can ask your questions in the chat box. Um, any questions that we don't get to will be addressed offline in the coming days, and I will let you know by email and on social media and things like that when that's ready. Remember that if you leave the meeting, if you've actually pressed leave meeting on Zoom, that you may not get back in. I, we did have for over 400 people register um, and we are not yet at 100. So the chances of that happening are very, very low. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. But, you know, we all of a sudden we may reach 500 and you might not be able to get in. Um, if you do want to step away from your device, that's fine. Turn your camera off, turn your microphone off and um, give have a little break. It's fine. Fine with us. Now, lastly, um, I'm sure this will happen anyway, but please keep things, comments and questions in the chat relevant and polite. Um, remember that our code of conduct for UK genealogy is to be excellent to each other, as um, Bill and Ted once said. So that's the housekeeping done and the introductions. I'm now going to start Guy and Josh's presentation. Guy and Josh are from the Turing Institute and they are going to speak to us today about their Living with Machines project. So um, if you could put your cameras on, Guy and Josh, then and give us a wave. Yeah, that's good. Then we will get your video started. So Hello, welcome to this talk on historic census data and the Living with Machines project, uh, which is a large scale academic uh, collaborative project uh, based at the Alan Turing Institute in London. My name is Josh Rhodes and I'm a research associate on the Living with Machines project. And today I'm co-presenting with my colleague Guy Solomon, who will be introducing himself very shortly. So today we wanted to uh, firstly kind of introduce ourselves and also introduce the project Living with Machines um, and a, a bit, to give you a bit of, uh, sort of context and background on, on the type of work we're doing on the project. We then wanted to talk you through the, uh, the specific work we've been doing on, on, on uh, digitized historic census data. So what, the work we've been mainly doing on 19th century and early 20th century census data. Then Guy's going to talk about the role of technology in our work, um, both in his own work and also the wider uh, Living with Machines project. And then lastly, I'm going to um, talk briefly about um, open data, um, what that means for us uh, and, and the kinds of possibilities that I think it might open up for, uh, for research in the future. So now I'm going to pass over to Guy, who's going to tell you about himself and also about the, the project more generally. Thanks, Josh. Uh, so my name is Guy Solomon, and I'm another of the research associates working on the Living with Machines project. So what is Living with Machines? Uh, well, we're one of the largest collaborations between the humanities and sciences uh, in UK history. Uh, we're funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council uh, and based at the Alan Turing Institute in London in collaboration with the British Library and several other partner institutions around the country. Um, the project aims to ex explore uh, the impact of industrialization on everyday people um, during the long 19th century. So we're talking about the 19th century and the early 20th century here in particular. And so our team is composed of people from a variety of uh, backgrounds, including curators, historians, computational linguists, geographers and data scientists. Um, and within that, uh, everyone has has different disciplinary backgrounds as well. So the project draws on digitized collections of sources from our period um, and then employs uh, computational uh, analytical tools to really analyze these at scale. So we're able to look at the, the experience of, of individuals, but we're able to look at this across the country and draw commonalities between people in different places. Uh, we have a strong emphasis on open data sets and on open methods. Um, and this is something that we really look to engage with uh, throughout all of our work. So we draw on a variety of source materials, 
uh, such as Ordnance Survey Maps, Newspaper Transcriptions, uh, Gazetteers, Press and Trade Directories, in order to really build up a, an idea of, of how technology influences society during this period. Um, and these sources allow us to do a number of different things. But they, if we're looking at the, the experience of individuals in particular, uh, census data becomes particularly important. So when we're talking about using census data on living with machines, primarily we're talking currently anyway about using the ISEM database. ISEM stands for Integrated Census Microdata, um, and it's a full transcription of every individual uh, in the census enumerators books for most of the censuses in the second half of the 19th century and the early 20th century. Uh, now, ISM is a fantastic resource. It's something that most academics uh, working with census data are familiar with, uh, but it's also commercially sensitive. Um, and therefore, there are some restrictions on what we're able to release from it. So the main thing to, to know is that there are, are two types uh, or there are two versions of the database. Uh, the, the standard version is anonymized and then the special license version contains things like uh, names, um, along with some other information as well. And so there are some implications there for, for how we need to work with, with the database. So on living machines, we're particularly interested in all forms of linking. So we're interested in linking between census years. So we want to say, let's find, so we're, we're, but we're doing a scale across the whole country. We want to say, let's find this individual in 1851 and let's find them again in 1861. And again, do that for, for as many people as we can across the country. Um, and that's a really powerful way of building up these longitudinal studies, tracing individuals over their lifetimes. Um, and we can start asking questions. If we, if we do that, we can start saying, well, okay, let's find, let's find the handling weavers in 1851. So we know that power looms um, the mechanization of, uh, of of looms has a, obviously a big impact on on handling weavers, and that, that's an impact that predates 1850. But even in 1851, there's still about 80 around 80,000 handling weavers. Well, we know by 1861 that there's only 20,000 handling weavers. So, so what happened to the handling weavers um, who effectively lost their job? What what jobs did they have to do instead? How did they how did they adapt? And so then, by by linking specific handling weavers or specific individuals between the two census years. We can start to to get at those questions in a way that does it at scale across the country for as many people as possible, but also that's rooted within the, the sort of life cycle and the life histories of those uh, uh, of each of those individuals. The other way that um, living machines is interested in linking uh, linking data with the census and um, um, uh, in terms of the census is is linking the census to other sources. Um, so in some ways, this is about enriching the census data. So taking what, what, what's in the census data, but adding to it in some way. And one of the big ways we're doing this is geocoding census data. So ISEM, the way it appears, it, it, it's just the, um, uh, it just gives you the names of, like you just got the names of places. So for example, the name of a street, you, that street, you can't, you can't take that street and say, you can't plot that on a map at the moment. You need to associate um, that street with a particular line or a particular point in space so so, so that so mapping software would know that that oh you mean that street there and and you can plot it on a map at the moment ISM can't do that um, so a lot of our work is based on trying to geocode and enhance and basically turn those those uh, names of streets into into points that you can you can link to on a map and what we hope to do by doing that is by linking uh, geocoding the census in that way, as well as uh, at the same time geocoding um, other sources. So finding place information in newspapers, finding place information in trade directories, in um, using railway data to then link all of those by place and triangulate um, those sources to, to tell really rich stories of particular places that have been impacted by industrialization. And then the other, finally, so the other way that Living Machines is, is, is doing things slightly differently with the census data is that we have a real focus on um, anywhere we can. We want to be able to release the tools, so like the code, uh, for example, that we've developed. We want to release the tools and the data that we've produced for others to reuse and build on. Um, and that's a real, uh, a real focus of the project. And this is the work uh, we've been doing on geocoding census uh, streets. 
so what are we interested in doing? Well, we want to take um, uh, an example like this where we have uh, uh, a census enumerator book from 1891 here uh, on the right, and we have a street called West Orchard. And that appears uh, in, in, in transcriptions of census data uh, as obviously just, just the name West Orchard. It doesn't have any other information. It's not linked to anything. It's just, just the words West, or West Orchard. Now, what we want to do is we want to say, right, well, we can locate West Orchard on the map there, on the left-hand side, a map, an ordnance survey map produced around, around 1900. Um, so only 10 years after, nine, 10 years after uh, the 1891 census was taken. And we want to say, we want to be able to associate the word West Orchard as it appears in the census and everyone who uh, who's listed on West Orchard Street in the census with that street as it appears on the map located geographically as it, as it were, you know, as if you're on Google Maps in the, in the exact location that West Orchard Street appears um, in Coventry uh, in this case, in this example. So that's essentially what we want to do. Um, and the reason why we want to do that is because it will enable us, if we fix, if we can link that, that, that census street uh, to the sort of physical street or ge a geographic location on a map, it allows us to then link other data sets um, by virtue of their relationship spatially to that point. And then we can link through that point those two data sets. So we'll be able to ask questions like, well, if we've got, if we know that a railway, where a railway station is, and we know that someone lives on this street, we'll be able to measure how far that, it, you know, how far those two are apart. And then we can ask questions like, well, did certain types of people or groups of people uh, tend to live near railway stations in the 19th century? Um, and then we might be able to ask, well, did the building of the railways impact certain groups then more than others through the development of railway, railway infrastructure? We might be able to go a step further. We might be able to then start linking. Well, we know people who lived on this street in this year. Um, well, why don't we look at trade directories, um, which often have street indexes in them, telling us um, just not everyone who lived on the street, but there can be a lot of people who lived on the street. And then that might allow us to start reconstructing people's lives in between the census years. And that will give us a much richer picture of people's lives um, than we would have otherwise if we were just reliant on census data. So how do we go about doing this? Well, as I think I've mentioned, there are two versions of ISEM. There's the anonymized version, and then there's the special license version. Now, it's only the special license version that contains people's names and street addresses. And the access to the special license version is very restricted, and it's not possible to release any of the enriched data sets. So we could, we could geocode all of these addresses, and these addresses could be, you know, you could you could map where those, those those streets are, but you wouldn't be able to release that because it's based on that restricted data set. So can we find a different way to do this? Well, yes, we can. And one of the ways we can we can um, uh, find a, a, an alternative way is to use the old census street indexes um, that we used to use before we were able to search for census addresses online on on Ancestry or Find My Past. So what do I mean by this? I mean by um, we've teamed up with the National Archives, who've kindly provided us the data behind this, um, to use uh, street indexes, which they had digitized um, and are now um, available on, a, on an archive website. And these indexes um, take this the following form. So if we were to browse to the 1891 pages, and we're, let's go to Coventry, because that's where we're going to be focusing some of our work. And let's find West Orchard. Now, what these indexes are, I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. Um, they give us a street name, some extra information, but they also give us a census reference, which we can then link back to the census uh, in order to help us um, pull through some extra information in order to, to link these uh, to a geographic location. And we could scroll down and we can find um, West Orchard uh, here. Now, what we can effectively do is we can say, right, well, this is some address data. This is the street West Orchard. Um, there's a link here to the census because we can use a census reference. So what we're going to do is we're going to effectively um, geolocate or geocode this name, West Orchard, 
taken from the, the street indexes. So we're going to take all of these streets appearing on this web page and, uh, 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 and all the other web pages on this site um, provided to us by the, uh, the National Archives. And we're going to associate them with a, a particular point on the map. The way we're going to do that is we're going to use, um, we're going to link them to uh, an already existing gazetteer of places, uh, which you may have heard of, called GB1900. Um, and this is what GB1900 looks like. GB1900 um, was a project that um, transcribed place names as, you know, streets, footpaths, any, any, any names appearing on um, six inch to the mile ordnance survey maps um, produced between 1888 and 1913. So if we zoom in on Coventry here, zoom right in, you'll see that for all the different street names, We've got points associated with them and then a transcription. If we click on that and you'll see here, we can see Hale Street and we can see there's a transcription of the name Hale Street. So effectively, what we can do is we can take that GB1900 data, um, which gives us the names of streets and we can link it to the, the, the National Archive Street Indexes. And then by virtue of those, the fact that those two sources are linked, we can then link the um, we because we can then link the, the National Archives street indexes back to the census data, we can effectively associate individual people in the census with these particular points on the map. And once we've done those links, this is what, this is the kind of thing we can do. The, the, these, this is, the, these are just preliminary kind of findings, like, um, but uh, these are the kinds of things we can do. So let's show, let's have a look. So this, now what we're doing is we're plotting the, the streets that appeared in those, that, that, that National Archives website. We're now gonna plot those on the map um, by virtue of the fact that we've, we've been able to link them through the uh, GB1900. So here are the points um, that we can link. These, each point is a street. Um, we don't have full coverage of the country purely because the whole country wasn't indexed as part of those indexes. It, they, they tended to index urban centers and we can see hopefully quite clearly that many of the um, most, mo basically the concentrations of points are in urban centers by and large. Um, but let's let's zoom in on um, on Coventry and we can see what's, what's happened here. Um, we can go around and we can we can look we can say right well there's here's Hale Street um, from before which I think we saw and we can see that basically we've managed to link the name Hale Street which appears on the TNA street indexes with that 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 mention of Hale Street in GB 1900 and so now we have this point data associated with it and once we've done that we can then say well let's let's do something with the people um, who live on Hale Street and let's let's analyze data so let's bring in sort of bring back the individuals and link them to these points Hopefully it will load in a second. Here we go. So now what I've done is I've <clears throat> on each of those points, um, we've now brought through the 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 age of of the household head uh, from the census, and we could do things like and again these these are just preliminary findings, just a sort of proof of concept in terms of showing you that once you've made these links, you can then bring through lots of different census information, um, as well as then it means that you can then link this with other data sets. But let's for example go down to Manchester, and we can see if we open up the legend um, the the hexagons that are white so basically the 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 darker blue hexagons uh, the, the the darker blue you get the older the the average household um, head is so um, you'll see on the left that if, if the hexagons white they're, they're under 43 and so you can start to see that central Manchester um, with the population substantially younger um, than surrounding rural areas and we're able to do this in a way that's much more fine-grained than you would have been able to do uh, previously by, by virtue of the fact that we're linking the census uh, information uh, directly to uh, very localized specific points um, around streets. So the example that Josh has just discussed uh, is, is one aspect of the work that we're doing with census data on living with machines. Uh, but I think it, it becomes very evident that uh, living with machines is not just about historical technology, 
but also about applying technology to our current research. Um, and indeed, I, I think it demonstrates certainly what, what Josh has just been discussing, quite how fruitful those techniques can be. So historically, working with these types of data, uh, census and, and the other sorts of things we use on living with machines in general, um, was difficult because working with it at scale required a lot of, of human input, uh, both in terms of transcription and analysis. And so technology has the potential to, to make this easier in, in two main ways. Firstly, through automation, uh, which allows us to undertake tasks which would not be feasible uh, to, to do by hand uh, on, a, on a, a broad scale on, on large databases. Um, secondly, it allows us to, to broaden access to, to existing uh, data and facilitate uh, the involvement of people who are interested in such data. Um, so we employ both of these techniques on living with machines, and these are very much complementary rather than competitive methods. Uh, so, for example, uh, with regards to newspapers, we, we ask volunteers to identify descriptions of machines in newspaper articles, uh, which is an example of crowdsourcing. Um, and this helped us to improve our computer reading queries uh, to automate this process uh, and take it, undertake it on a broader scale, um, which then allows us to circle back and ask different questions which volunteers can get involved with again. But when we're working with census data, uh, we have of, often have to rely more heavily on automation uh, than crowdsourcing. Um, and this is, is, as you might imagine, and, and as a consequence of the things we've been discussing already, in part due to uh, data access and, and licensing issues. Um, but there are a number of ways in which crowdsourcing census data might actually be really fruitful uh, and be really valuable. So if we're talking about um, linking records between different censuses or indeed two different sources of data, uh, crowdsourcing would be a fantastic way to do this because lots of people are interested in tracking their own family history. But at the minute, it's quite difficult to share this uh, within current arrangements. So working with, with open data, for example, FreeCent, um, might help this process to become more, more visible and, and more transparent, inherently more shareable. Um, we might also want to ask more complicated questions than can currently be reasonably carried out with computing techniques. Uh, computers are not uh, capable of, of undertaking the same analysis in the same way that humans are, and therefore analysing uh, complex data for subjective features is, is something that um, is difficult to replicate. And so whether it's creating linkages between data in relation to occupations, for example, uh, or creating aggregate data through automation, um, technology is now an integral part of research in this area. So I just want to finish off this talk by talking about um, a bit more about the kind of implications of open data and, uh, and the possibilities as we see them um, that they open up. Um, uh, and in, in many ways, this is building on um, what I mentioned in my case study, where we're using data like the, the National Archive Street Indexes, which which aren't subject to the same licensing conditions. We're, we're you know, um, we're able to enhance those and then re-release re those for, for, for everyone to use. Um, uh, and how that, that opens up new possibilities for, for what we can do with, with, with data and in particular census data. So um, commercial-based ge genealogy, obviously that's played a really important role in developing and broadening access to, 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 the, to these records, to census records. Um, they're providing you know, direct services which enable people to find out more about the past. It's raised lots and lots of interest in pub public interest in history. Um, we're able to do it uh, in, in many cases from, our, from the comfort of our own home. Um, and we wouldn't have things like ISEM, which is based on commercial transcriptions. We fundamentally we wouldn't have the millions and millions of individual records um, in ISEM if it weren't for, for the commercial transcriptions that they're based on. But I want to say that you know there are lots and lots of advantages or important advantages to, to open source data um, that I think hopefully are going to become increasingly uh, apparent um, over the next few years um, that will make it uh, quite compelling that uh, 
for, for people to start working with um, census data in, a, um, in, a, in as open way as possible. Um, the advantages are that with open data, so data that is released for anyone to use that isn't subject to licensing restrictions, um, it's not sort of a, you know commercially protected data, um, it would mean that any codes or, or methods or tools that are developed to work with that data, they can be released to others to use and others can, 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 can kind of um, can start with those and, and, and then build on them. And it means that you can build on more than just building on the tools and methods that you develop, you can build on each other's work. So someone could uh, someone could enrich the data, for example, in the way that we have, and then someone can take that enriched data and then do something else with it, maybe enrich it in another way or, or, or build it into something else that they're developing, rather than having to redo all the work because um, uh, if, you're, if you're working with data that subjects those licensing restrictions, you know you, you can't release it. Uh, for others to use in that way um, and then all the work you've done is, is sort of confined to the lifetime of the you know potentially the, the, the sort of project you're working on the other reason the other big advantage of, of open data is uh, it's going to you know really open up free access to public records in a digitized form um, because obviously we have the right to go and view uh, the originals for free in, in archives um, but visiting archives isn't isn't free in the sense of it you know involves the cost of travel um, if you want to look at uh, any more than a handful of records, you, you'd need to stay overnight in a hotel, for example. So um, it's really it would really democratize access to to, to our past, um, and it also opens up the ability or the possibility of linking, um, in this case, census data to lots of other sources um, to create uh, what's been called linked open data. So linking to already big open data sets like Wikidata, uh, for example. Um, and again, and that's that's data that would be available on the, on the internet uh, for others to kind of download at, uh, the leisure and, and link to and enhance, um, building up sort of a community uh, of data. Um, and finally, open data would, would would create new possibilities of projects where academics, researchers, and the public can really work together on on innovative like sort of crowdsourcing techniques. Um, uh, you could do lots of uh, interesting sort of things with nominal linkage, tracing people in a way that we can't you, you can't at the moment because because access to the the, the names name sensor state is much more restrictive, and that's why um, sites like FreeSend, sites like FreeBMD, which obviously under the Free UK Gen um, uh, group, um, <clears throat> are really exciting and absolutely something that um, Living Machines is is very keen to work with. Um, to, to, to make this sort of a, a, a reality. So thank you very much for listening um, and we look forward to, to any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you for that, Josh and Guy. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now and um, we're back in the room. So I'm going to just put up a quick poll from Guy and Josh, just to um, take the temperature a little bit of um, academic projects and, and your potential involvement in them. So you should be able to see the poll on your screen now. Would you be interested in undertaking genealogical research in partnership with academic projects? Graham, I think you're speaking, but you're muted. I was just talking to someone else in the room with me. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, um, so I'm going to end the poll in now. It seems it seems like we've we've settled on on that, and I'm going to share the results so you can all see. 36% said yes, no was 13%, and maybe was a was an, a very encouraging 51%. So thank you for, for sharing that. Now we've turned the chat on, so you can put your questions in there. And um, the first question came in was from Else, one of our speakers, and she asked, how are you dealing with small or rural communities in the census where streets and roads are seldom used? I believe the National Archives street indexes were only made for towns with populations over 20,000. So um, Guy and Josh, you may want to take your mics. 
off mute. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I, I can I can answer that one maybe. Um, yeah, that's it's it's a great question. It's absolutely right. Um, that's that's the trade off we're having to make. We can we can get we've we've got the list of all the streets, um, and it, you know every tiny place recorded in the census that's recorded in ISEM, um, and we'll be geocoding those as best we can um, on for use on the projects and for use in like publishing articles and uh, and books uh, uh, and those kinds of things. But we can't release that work. So what I proposed was we. Um, do do the best we can with something like the TNA street indexes, which obviously um, only covers a proportion of the country, mainly urban areas, but at least it would allow us to release some of that geocoding work, even if fundamentally that geocoding the TNA street indexes isn't going to be the equivalent to geocoding all of the, the streets that appear in the census that are, that are stored in the ISM day. So, so it's purely, we're doing both basically, but we can only release the, the TNA. What, what about what about the census where a street is not given in a rural area where they, they they frequently just give the village and there's nothing there's no streets at all well that when i say we won't be able to absolutely well anywhere we can make a possible link if if that place yeah. is mentioned um uh there, there's lots of challenges because i mean the, the gb 1900 data set it's based on um, the text that appears on six inch maps and there's lots and lots of streets that don't appear on those six inch maps because they're not detailed enough they'll miss small streets um, uh, so when we're over, it's not going to be a perfect uh, we're not perfectly capturing everything um, uh, you, you're absolutely right that yeah that again even with with ISEM and having a exactly what appears in the census or near enough um, you're absolutely right the rural areas aren't going to be that yeah they're not listed by streets like that we'll pick up the odd farm um which actually gb1900 yeah. picks up as well but uh, yeah um uh we'll have a measure of how well we capture it when we haven't done that work yet but when we do we'll have a measure of how well how well how, how well or how poorly we've captured uh those links in, in various areas thanks josh um i've had a question in that didn't go to everybody, it came directly to me, which is the National Archives archive their street index. Does this mean that they've made it available again? It's on um, yeah, it's on a web archive page. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm sure there are more people in the room that know much more about the history of the street indexes than I do. All I... Um, uh, my only knowledge of it is that I was looking online for street data relating to the census that um, looked as if it wasn't governed by strict licensing rules, you know, wasn't governed by commercial licensing rules and that, that that your archive site used to be an active site. I don't know why it isn't now, but it was mothballed and now it exists as a web archive. Um, and we contacted the TNA to, to ask if we could, could, could make use of that data that is just sort of sat there. Um, I don't know if that adequately answers that question or not, but, um, but. I think so. Thanks, Josh. Um, and we're, there's a group called Historians Collaborate. This came in from Anne Simcock, and she suggests that that might be a good organisation for you to co cooperate with. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're always looking for, for opportunities. Um, other parts of, of Living With Machines have, have run things through, through various organisations. Um, but the the joy of, of sort of having such a big project and working on so many different things is, is we get the opportunity to engage with different groups of people who have different interests. So um, yes, the suggestions like that are always always really valuable for us. Thank you. And from Ben, um, he says, lovely talk on a wonderful project. Thank you, Ben, on behalf of Josh and Guy. Um, but can you tell us a bit more about the methods for individual matching slash household um, can't see the rest of your question. Household matching across census years, anything that would suggest potential matches could be valuable for genealogists as well as demographic researchers. Um, this is this is work that I'm actually only just, well, we're only just about to, to start. So um, I haven't got anything to kind of, I'm, 
I'm definitely sort of behind the curve in terms of the 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 the, the wide variety of ways in which you can establish links between people and how you measure the success or 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 not of those. But that's definitely something that I would like to. Um, we're we're going to be doing that soon, um, and that'd be great to be able to have conversations about those techniques, how successful they are, what we can learn from from how other people are doing it, and maybe if we if we develop anything that is of use, it would be great to share that too. So it'd be great to sort of keep that kind of channel open as we're we're pursuing the, these lines of work. Brilliant. Well, thank you for um, answering those questions and thank you for your presentation. It was really very interesting. Um, and you can see that we've had a lot more questions in than we've had time to, to talk about right now. And I'm just going to remind everybody that any questions that don't get addressed, we will send them to the speakers. The speakers can answer offline and we'll make those answers available to everybody after the, after the event. So do keep an eye on your inbox and our social media. So, um, yep, thank you, Guy and Josh. Now moving on to our speaker number two, which is Sarah Callis. Um, she's going to, well, I'm going to present her presentation for you on Wikitree, the free family tree. And after that, again, we'll have a, a short poll and you'll be able to put your questions to Sarah. So here I go with my screen share again. And Sarah's video will play. Hello everyone, thanks for watching. My name is Sarah and I am a Wikitree team member and I'm here today to tell you all about Wikitree. So maybe you've heard of Wikitree before in the genealogy grapevine. Maybe you're an ex experienced user of Wikitree or maybe you've never heard of it before. Well, in either case, I will tell you a little bit about it. So unlike a lot of other genealogy sites where you build your tree and I build my tree, and we never talk to each other just by sharing several deep ancestors. On Wikitree, when we get to that common ancestor, we work together to find information, share sources, resolve discrepancies, and this was one of the first websites to do so. It was started in 2008 by Chris Witten, who had the idea of the shared family tree. What also sets Wikitree apart from other sites is that it's free and it will always be free. And now, how do we stay free, you ask? Well, Wikitree is an ultra low cost operation. Almost everything is done by volunteers. I would say about 95%. And by keeping costs low, we are able to cover expenses through modest ads on public pages. So if you're logged into Wikitree, you will not see any ads. So maybe you're thinking, okay, free single family tree, you can probably think of a few sites that do this. But what sets Wikitree apart is our community. What really, you know, the free, the single family tree, but it's our community that really makes us stand out from all of those other websites. It's a place where people can come together and work on our tree. As we're all cousins, we are all connected. Now, when many different people are working together on the same ancestors and profiles, there are bound to be misunderstandings, mistakes, etc. But with our honor code, which every member of Wikitree needs to sign to start making contributions to the tree, and enables us to have mutual trust and a common understanding of how the community works. It's a pledge that the community members make to each other. Now I'm gonna go through the, we have nine points on our honor code. I'm gonna go through them. They're a little bit obvious, but I'm still gonna go through them with you. So the first point is we collaborate. We share profiles, we pull resources, we sometimes work in groups together, like projects, and I'll talk about projects a little bit later. We work together as a community to solve problems. Now our second point is we care about accuracy. We verify the information we enter, we correct mistakes when we find them, 
and we include good documentation for the next person. Now our third point on the honor code is mistakes are unintentional. We know mistakes are inevitable. We're only human, we all make mistakes, and we assume best intentions. There is a learning curve on Wikitree and we all have to recognize that. And we also have mentors and mediators that are able to help for people who are maybe not understanding and making some mistakes. The fourth point on our honor code is be courteous. Like I said in the previous one, assume the best, the golden rule, treat others as you wanna be treated. And now we have a motto on Wikitree, DWWA. Don't Wikitree while angry, because more than likely while you're angry on and on Wikitree, you're unlikely to be as courteous as you wanna be. You wanna stop, drop, and roll. Now the fifth point, we respect privacy. Each profile has an independently managed privacy setting and you're able to adjust that. And so profiles for living people are unlisted, but privacy settings are about privacy and not for control. And I'll talk about our privacy settings a little bit later as well. Our sixth point, we respect copyrights. We respect the copyrights of others and we make our own copyrights clear. The seventh point, we give credit. And while most genealogy isn't copyrighted, researchers deserve the credit for the work they've done. The eighth point, which is genealogists, we all know, genealogy without documentation is mythology. So we cite sources, because without sources, we can't objectively resolve conflicting information. And it helps to resolve these conflicts and discrepancies and it also keeps our promise to be accurate. And on Wikitree, we require every profile that's created to have a source on it. And as we go further back in time, there are higher standards for these sources, such as for pre-1700, the sources have to be a primary source. And the last point, which is probably the, maybe the best point, like we said before, it's free. We are on a united mission to increase the world's common store of knowledge. We always respect copyrights and privacy, but we keep information as free and open as possible. So that is our honor code. So if you join Wikitree and you wanna make contributions, you have to sign our honor code. It keeps us all working together with courtesy and keeps everything in balance. Now, we'll take a look at the profiles for a person. So we have, on each profile, you have your standard data. You have your birth dates, death dates, and locations. And you also have the relationships, such as the parents, the siblings, spouses, and children. So you have all of that. But on Wikitree, not only can you put in the hard data, but you're also able to create a biography which adds color to our ancestors because our ancestors are not just dates and names, right? They are people and they deserve to have their story told. And one way that we do this on Wikitree, we have what we like to call profile bling or biography bling. And one of these things is our stickers. And our stickers gives an at glance info for a person, for instance, Dr. King, it says that he's a notable, and he was also part of the US Civil Rights Activist Movement. And we have many different stickers on Wikitree. You can put stickers for careers, for migrations, for if your ancestor migrated from one country to another, you can put a sticker for that. And if you don't find a sticker, and there are plenty of stickers, trust me, you can have one made. Now, because it's, our honor, it's in our honor code. The most important aspects to any tree are its sources. So you're able to include, and this is at the bottom of the biography, 
has your sources and you list them out. And you're also able to, if you wish, it does require a little bit more of advanced editing to add inline references. So you're able to list a source for each fact as you're writing the biography. And like I said, this is not required. Another feature on Wikitree is our categories. It allows us to group certain profiles together. They can be grouped by location, job, awards, etc. The possibilities are endless. And as you can see, Dr. King, ha Dr. King has a whole bunch of different categories on his profile. And now, while sources are required, you don't have to put stickers or categories. They're just a nice feature on Wikitree that you're able to use. So like I said before, it's part of our honor code, privacy. So let's talk a little bit more about our privacy settings on Wikitree. So like I said, they're all independently managed per profile. So we have a few different settings. Our most locked up profile, the pro locked up privacy setting is our unlisted. And these are only an option for living people and living people who have not volunteered to be on Wikitree. So for instance, I add my mom to Wikitree so then I can add her parents, but my mom has not volunteered to be on Wikitree, so she is unlisted. No information is shown. Now we have a few different private settings for your more modern ancestors. So maybe you don't want the full date shown or you don't want the biography shown or something along those lines. So you're able to choose between those four. And then we have the public setting, which means anybody can see everything on the profile, but only people on the trusted list can edit it. And basically a trusted list is people who are given permission to edit it. So people who are trusted with this information. And that's the same with any of the private, any of the other privacy settings. If you're on the trusted list, you can see it and you can edit it. And now we have the open privacy setting. And in the open privacy setting, anyone can view the full profile and also anyone who has signed the honor code can edit it. And now this setting is required for people born over 150 years ago or who died over 100 years ago, because that is the point of our single family tree. As our older ancestors, we all have, we all share those ancestors. There's a whole bunch of descendants. So if other people can't edit it, what is the point? So open is required for those older profiles. So not only do we have person profiles, but there are other pages called free space pages, which gives the ability, the ability to create a page about literally anything. This is an example of a free space page somebody created where they looked at what their different, where different ancestors settled in a, a community. And they included maps, links to the other profiles. They also included sources. So it kind of gives you a visual of something that is not a person. So if you wanted people use them for one place studies, for one name studies, and if you wanted maybe to transcribe a will for one of your ancestors, but it was it's just so long and it would be daunting on a profile, you can use a free space page and then link it to that profile. We also have some genealogy societies using free space pages as their main website where they can have all their members come in and look at it. So pretty much if you can dream it, you can put it on a free space page. I know people have also created free space pages for their pets, their family pets, because pets are part of the family. Now I mentioned projects briefly. So projects are when a group of members are organized around a specific topic. And we have three categories of projects. Geographical, such as our England project. We also have other, pretty much every geographical location is covered. 
India, Scotland, Ireland, United States, Central America, South America, Australia. I think the only one that's not covered is probably Antarctica. <laughs> the next one is our topical projects, such as our one name study project, our notables project, religion, Magna Carta, lots of different topical projects. Then the last category is our functional projects, and these serve a vital function to WikiTree, such as our greeters project, and our greeters are our friendly face to WikiTree. So new members are greeted and given help by our greeters. So if you join, a greeter will come in, say hello to you, kind of help you navigate WikiTree, because as I said, it does have a little bit of a learning curve. And all of these projects are run by our volunteers, like I said, 95% 90, volunteer driven. And we have so many projects that you're more than likely able to find your niche and where you want to work. But even if, if you aren't and you find a different topic you want to work on, different kind of function, you are able to create a project if you want. You create a free space page, get other members to help you, and create a project. Another aspect, we do have a form on Wikitree. It's called Genealogist to Genealogist, or short, G2G. Now, most Wikitreeers will refer to it as G2G. And our G2G is where Wikitreeers can go to get help. If they're having trouble with a brick wall, they need help translating a document, just or just general genealogy device about pretty much anything. And our Wikitreeers are always very responsive. There's always someone on the forum ready to answer your question. So it's really great. So our form is not only just for asking for help. You can, there are other aspects to these forms. So if somebody helped you break down a brick wall, you can thank them. You can share some photos of your ancestors. You can share your achievements or your finds, or maybe you broke down your own brick wall and you want to share it with our community. And we also have on the weekends, it's called a weekend chat. So from Friday to Sunday, our volunteers host this chat and it's where our community gets together to catch up with one another, to see what, how they're doing in life and their genealogy, just about everything. Nothing is off limits pretty much on these weekend chats. And it really just lets us keep in touch with each other as we are a community. As I mentioned, that's what really sets us apart as a website. Now, we have our weekend chat. We also have other weekly features and sharing opportunities. So each week, we, sh we feature a group of profiles that revolve around a certain theme. As you can see, we've done royals, chefs, authors, women suffrage activists, notables, Irish notables, communications innovators, wildlife experts, Golden Globe winners, Motown music musicians. So each week we feature usually about nine profiles that revolve around this theme. And they're usually from across the globe that we try, we try to vary our profiles. And what's really great is our Wikitreeers, our members, usually help us decide which profiles are going to be featured. And they help us improve these profiles as they are. This is on the home page of Wikitree. So they're out there for everybody to see the first thing they see on the home page. And, uh, and another feature we have is member of the week. So each week we interview one of our Wikitree members. And this get, lets us get to know who was in our community. And it just, like I said, really brings everybody together and just become a bigger family. So these profiles are featured notables and our member of the week. They all get put into our connection finder, which is a really awesome feature of Wikitree. So the connection finder 
lets people see how one profile is connected to another in degrees, in degrees of separation. And it's not just by blood, but also includes the marriages in between. But it really gives us that sense that we're all really a big family. And that's the point of WikiTree, the shared family tree to see how we're all connected. And now, like I said, the featured profiles are put into the connection finder. But at any point, you're able to see how one profile is connected to another, whether they're featured or not. So in this example, it's how I am connected to Prince, Prince Philip, and it shows I am 24 degrees away from him. And now if you see the color changes on the, like from green to yellow, that means there is there was a marriage connection. So you have his brother, then his wife, father, father, sister, and then husband. So the color changes do that. But even though it's not by blood, I am still connected to him in the tree. And some other weekly features we have, sharing opportunities are such as the question of the week. So each week we hold a prompt, a question for our volunteers to answer. In this instance, we were asking, do you have any artists in your tree? So people, it's on, and that's on our form. The next, the, the sharing opportunities are gonna be on our form. So you're able to answer, people share photos, people share stories of their ancestors. So I'm assuming in the artist one, a lot of people posted pictures of the art that their ancestors have done. And we have a lot of different fun themes and topics for our question of the week. We always have a nice little graphic that's done too. And we also post these on social media. So if it's not on the form, you can also answer it on Facebook or Twitter. Now, one of my favorite things is our photo sharing. So each week we have a different topic theme for a photo. And we use these photos that people share with us and choose our photo of the week. And that gets put on our homepage. So as an example, this one was featured one week, uh, Maggie with a, a cute little dog named Laddie. And it also gets featured on our social media pages. I love looking through all the photos each week it's so much fun to see all of the photos that people share. And just to mention, so every Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern time, I host a live cast where we discuss all of the weekly features on, on Wikitree. We give some updates, and then we also go through all of the photos. And it's a really fun time. And it's my favorite part of Saturday morning, maybe of the whole weekend, looking at all these photos and people are interacting and commenting about the photos in this live cast. So if you're ever interested, you can check us out on YouTube or Facebook, and that's where we host these live casts. And now you might be familiar with 52 Ancestors that is hosted by Amy Johnson Crow. So we also host a version of that, which it always is the same theme that she does. So you're able to link them up if you want. And so, like I said, these are on our form. So you're able to answer in the form, link your profile that you have on Wikitree. And all of these weekly features is a chance for our members to share information about their ancestors, maybe touch up profiles, add new profiles, because they're like, oh yeah, my one ancestor was an artist, but he's not on Wikitree yet. Let me add his profile. So all of this just helps improve Wikitree. Cousin bait. Now, if you haven't heard the word before, cousin bait is huge for genealogy in the digital age. You're basically baiting your cousins with information online to contact you. We have many success stories of cousin bait on Wikitree. A lot of people will share their cousin bait stories on our social media pages with on Twitter. And one of the reasons why Wikitree is great for cousin bait is because all of our pages are indexed by Google. 
not the private ones, obviously, all of the public pages are indexed by Google. And if someone is searching for your ancestor, it'll probably be a top result. I, for example, did a quick search on Dr. Martin Luther King. So I searched Martin Luther King genealogy and the Wikitree page came up as number four on the results for the page. So we're usually, if you're doing the right searching, if, your aunt, if your cousin's doing the right search, they'll probably find your page. So the more information you are writing in the biographies, the more names, dates, the more accurate information is there, the more, more than likely you will have a cousin find you if they're also searching the same ancestor. So now, another fun aspect of our community is our challenges. Now, it's where our community really comes together to do amazing things. And we are human, you know, we all like a little bit of competition, it kind of ignites us right? It ignites our competitive nature, these challenges. And it also it gives us the opportunity to improve WikiTree. So we have a variety of challenges. We have weekly ones for sourcing, and we also have ones that are for cleaning up the tree. So if there's maybe a date in the future, if somebody was born in the future, that obviously is not correct. So we have these data doctors, as we like to call them, and each week they focus on a certain error. Maybe, you know, it's missing the country in the location field. Like I said, we're in the future, potential duplicates. So they work on that and there's a challenge. So they kind of see who can get the most points. And now just to reiterate, it is about quality, not about quantity, but challenges just kind of give us that little bit of motivation to and it improves Wikitree. We also have monthly ones for building biographies. We also have sourcing one for monthly ones too, because we love sourcing. We also have monthly one for connecting profiles to the world tree. So if there's a profile kind of lingering that's not connected to the tree, you can make those connections and connect it to the tree. And that's another challenge we have. And now we have our big quarterly challenges, such as our Sourceathon. So every October, we hold a 72-hour marathon, nonstop. And the goal is to source as many unsourced profiles as we can. Some people don't sleep. They stay up the full 72 hours, and it's insane. But it really helps improve Wikitree. We also have video updates every few hours during these marathons. I am usually featured in most of them, but I do sleep, unlike some of these very dedicated people who don't sleep for 72 hours. So we usually host one of these marathons quarterly. So we have a Sourceathon in April. I'm sorry, Sourceathon in October. In April, we have our Cleanathon, which is that cleaning up the tree kind of thing, those errors, those suggestions date in the future, potential duplicates. So that we usually have in April, the clean-a-thon. Then we've been also doing a scan-a-thon where we encourage people to scan and upload their photos of their ancestors. So it ki kind of encourages people if you have that box of photos sitting that you've been meaning to scan. So it encourages people to like, okay, there's a challenge for putting up photos. Let me go ahead and scan them. So we have a challenge for that. And that's huge. We've been having that in January. And then during the summertime, we have a connectathon where we try to add more profiles to the tree to just expand those nuclear relatives that maybe, you know, you have the parent, the child, the child, the child, just the direct line. But we want to expand that out to add more lines to the tree because it's not just about that, it's about everybody. And so those are our challenges, but we do have one more challenge. And this year, we started our biggest challenge yet, the WikiTree Challenge, where each week we take on a different genealogy guest star's tree. And we make it more accurate and complete than it is anywhere else. We've had some big names, 
you probably recognize Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr., Thomas McEnty, C.C. Moore, Tim Jansen, Johnny Pearl, Jen Baldwin, Pat Richley Eric Sanner, aka Dear Myrtle. We've had a lot of people be part of our Wiki Tree Challenge. And let me tell you, they've all been very appreciative of the work we've done on their trees. Because a lot of them, they're professional genealogists. They don't really have time to work on their tree. So we go in and we work on their tree. And we've brought some to tears, let me tell you. They get very emotional because it's their family. And we're breaking brick walls, improving their tree, adding sources, maybe fixing some mistakes that we found. And so all of our wiki treaters get together and they do this. And we're only about halfway done through the year. We have six more months to go. So you can check it out. And you're able to even you're e even able to participate in the challenge if you want to. Sign up on Wikitree, sign the honor code, and you're able to register to help us help these genealogy guest stars. So now I've explained to you more or less what Wikitree is. There is a lot to learn on Wikitree. Like I said, there's a learning curve. I know I always learn something new every day. Many other experienced Wikitree members learn something new. I'm always finding a new feature, a new way to do something. So much to learn, but we have so many friendly volunteers that are willing to help and jump in our wonderful community that we have that I mentioned before. So we have the forum. You're always able to ask questions. You can also send people a private message or leave comments on their profile. A lot of different ways to interact. And like I said, Wikitree is a community and we're all working together to make this possible, to make the free single family tree possible. So I just wanna thank you all for watching. You can definitely, like I had mentioned before, we're on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm usually managing these social media profiles, so if you interact with any of them, it'll probably be me answering. And obviously, you can check us out at wikitree.com. And if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to anyone on Wikitree. You can reach out to me if you want, sarah at wikitree.com. Oh my gosh, you're probably going to flood my emails now. Or you can message anyone on Wikitree. So thank you again for watching, and I hope you all enjoyed it thank you thank you sarah um and thank you especially for being with us when you're not feeling 100 percent today um we really appreciate it okay we're back in the room i'm now going to put up uh just a quick poll for sarah's presentation um and we're going to switch the chat on so you can ask sarah your questions and here we go. You should see this on your screen now. Had you heard of Wikitree before today? And have you used or would you consider using Wikitree for your own family tree if you answered yes? Um, sorry, um, yeah, would you consider using it? About two thirds of the way through the attendees voting. Starting to slow down a bit. Lots of people have already heard of Wikitree, that's good. Um, Andrew on the chat said that he's used it a lot before and also already has a question in there for you. So um, I think we've settled down a little bit. Everybody answered. So I'm going to end the polling now and share the results with you. There you go. Nice results there for Wikitree. Thank you for everyone voting. And now um, I'm gonna open this up to Sarah. And um, first of all, I think Andrew Turvey, um, one of the trustees of Free UK Genealogy asks, um, the site seems quite US focused. Do you have any plans to try and make it more global? Uh, we, cause it's, it started in the United States. So it definitely is more US 
cent you know focused at least at first but we do have a lot of like I, I talked about the the projects that we have we have a large base in england some we have a team member in slovenia and we have a team member in australia so the we are we have we that's our goal we want to have other genealogists in other countries but you know we they need to come on and then start adding those profiles you know for other countries to wikitree so that's that's the focus and that those uh country projects also would help you know expanding our base because the more that's on wikitree from other countries is what's going to draw more people in so that's what we're always working towards that and expanding and be trying to become more global and we're always trying to translate a lot of our help pages and profiles into different languages when we can as well so Thanks, Sarah. Um, also, we've got a question from Andrew Millard, who is from Januki, charity based in the UK. Um, is Wikitree open data that can be used by projects and linked, for example, to the census data we heard about in the previous talk? So, so Wikitree has um, all of the data is open. Anybody can grab any of its information. A lot of people do create apps and um and pulled information for different um purposes so yeah there's definitely no problem you can definitely come on and we can talk about um like collaborating or you know using information or if you have questions on how to do it we have we have an apps project where a whole bunch of coders make a whole bunch of different kinds of apps um like there's one where they basically able to pull from family search or ancestry to like populate information into wikitree and a vice versa, like being able to export as well into any kind of version. It's just a matter of coding it, if that makes sense. So really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of scope for, for collaboration there, yeah, then, I guess. Definitely. Um, and from Karen, can you upload a GEDCOM file into Wikitree? Yes, you can. So it is different from other websites where you'd upload a GEDCOM because our goal is not to have any duplicates. So when you do upload your GEDCOM file, you do have to go through, it's kind of it's called dead match where it shows your GEDCOM and, and then it has potential matches that you have. So then you've linked them up. And so creating, you know, saying, okay, this person from my GEDCOM is already on a wiki tree. And you basically go through and add all of those. But usually once you get two or three generations in, you're more than likely to find um, ancestors already on a wiki tree. So we usually recommend starting with a small, GEDCOM file because it is um, a little, it can be tedious just because you have to individually go through each one. So if you upload a 2000 person GEDCOM, that can take a bit. So uploading a couple hundred at a time, and then you'll eventually find that probably people are already on Wikitree. Okay. And um, Christopher Pryor asks Can we import data from other tools? Yeah, yeah, we yeah. So, like I said, Wikitree does have. Um, Not me. The, Will you look very small? Oh, wait. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so the that um the complicated to learn. Yeah, Wikitree does have a little bit of learning curve, but there's a lot of people on Wikitree that are willing to help, and. And I always bookmark everything because I mean, it does take when you find something on Wikitree and usually it's a little bit hard to find it again. So I always recommend bookmarks and <laughs> just keeping that information. But we do have a lot of resources and very friendly community that's always willing to help. So Wonderful. Um, so um, oh, I think we've got time for this last one. So how does it work if you find some incorrect data? So as it is a wiki site, depending on how old the ancestor and it's not like privacy locked, if it's as simple as, you know, adding a, like changing some text, you can go ahead and do that. But if there is, you know, an incorrect date, location, name, you know, you would want to reach out to the person who created the profile. There is a profile manager, that person who is the curator of the profile and reach out and see what sources they have there if there are none on the profile or look at those sources um but you you are able to add research notes in the bio you're also able to link a form question to a profile to kind of collaborate and see what how that goes but usually if it's something is incorrect we want it fixed and you know we encourage um accuracy 
Great, thank you, Sarah. And thank you for being with us today again. And thank you for recording your presentation ahead of time. It was really interesting. Um, and again, another wonderful open data organization doing really great things with genealogical data. So um, that brings us to the end of part one of part one of our conference. And we're gonna have a break now um, where you can go um, get comfortable and grab a coffee, a cup of tea, and definitely a sweet treat, maybe some cake or some biscuits to go with your hot drink. And we will be back at uh, 5.35 with a live Q&A with Michelle Leonard of Genes and Genealogy. So um, if you've got any DNA questions, get them ready while you're drinking your coffee and tea, and we'll see you back in about 20 minutes time. Thank you. Bye.
I think people are starting to come back now. I think we can get started, stay on track. Oh, um, right. So we're really lucky to have Michelle Leonard with us right now from um, Genes and Genealogy. She is the official genetic genealogist of Twitter's hashtag Ancestry Hour, which reminds us when that is, Michelle. It is on a Tuesday evening, uh, UK time between 7 and 8 p.m. And people can come along and chat all sorts uh, about genealogy, family history, DNA, anything like that. And I'm usually, if I can, be on hand to answer some DNA queries along the way. Wonderful. Um, OK, great. So we've got some um, previously submitted questions that you've had some time to um yeah. What with some answers for? I've I've got the questions on a on a image. I could try and share my screen, or if you, are, are you yeah, no, please, yeah, because I I have them here in a sheet, but I can't see the whole question. <laughs> it okay. cuts off, so I'm not sure why. Um, but yeah, that would be great if you could share them on your screen, so um, I can see them properly. <laughs> okay, so um, hopefully, I can find these out. Oh. Bear with me. Um, they should have been opened previously, but here we go. So do you want to talk us through question one? OK, so question one is saying I'm researching my husband's family tree. We had DNA tests done. and My husband has a 13 percent shared DNA match, which is 919 centimorgans, which is a measure of how much DNA we share with a match. The largest uh, segment of 152 with a lady in the USA with a suggested relationship of first cousin, great aunt, etc. The lady was of Polish origin, maiden name Vlad Ladska. <laughs> Sorry, I butchered that, I think, and had moved to the USA. My husband does have Lithuanian ancestors, but the relationship does not appear to be down that line. What would be the best way to try and solve the mystery of this relationship? As despite us both having gone back quite a long way in both family histories, I haven't found any connection yet, which I would have expected with the suggested close match. Yes, this is a close relationship. Even if you have a double relationship or endogamy involved, 919 centimorgans is still a close relationship. So you shouldn't need to look too far back in time to find the connection. And if you are looking too far back in time in both trees and not finding the connection, then the only real explanation for that is that one or the other genealogy has a error in it. There's a genetic mistake, which we might call a misattributed parentage event, or uh, some people might call it an NPE, a non-paternity event. I'm not really a fan of that term. Um, maybe if we use not the parent expected instead of non-paternity event, because there's definitely been a paternity event. It's just perhaps not the person we expected it to be. So in this situation, you have to work out, okay, so whose genealogy is matching their DNA and whose isn't um, on both sides of this coin. So look at the shared matches between the two of you. For instance, let's say you see your husband's second and third cousins, known people showing up in those shared matches and that can narrow things down to how this person fits in. And those known cousins are matching you in the way you would expect and you all descend from the same ancestors on your husband's family tree, then that would suggest that it's this lady that has uh, an unknown, a problem in her tree somewhere. However, if on the other hand, she's seeing lots of matches in, within the shared matches between the two of you to her known ancestors and you're not 
then it's the other way around. So that's the first thing you need to establish. Um, but the key is always going to be looking at the shared matches and also look at locations, not so much as surnames. Look at the grandparents and the great grandparents. Were any of these people in the same place at the same time on either your tree or her tree? Is there any locations in common? Uh, but a, a match of 919 centimorgans, it, you're probably looking at it, you know, it could be a first cousin, it could be a half aunt, it could be a half niece. You know, look at the age of the person, but don't slavishly look at the age and think, well, there's only two years between them, so they must be on the same generation. Yes, most of the time, people of the same age or a similar age are going to be on the same generation level, but some won't. I have a nephew older than me. You know, people are sometimes generations removed, even if they are of a similar age. So keep that in mind too, and look at the length of the generations going back in your trees as well uh, to see, uh, you know, and also look at the shared matches. If you have access to see how that person matches the shared matches and how your husband matches the shared matches, then is one or the other sharing significantly more with most of the shared matches? That would then suggest that the person sharing significantly more is the generation closer than the person sharing significantly less with them. So there's lots of things you can do to try and sort this out. But the key thing is that you have to delve into the shared matches and see who's matching who and who are the common ancestors that these shared matches have. And are there known ancestors for either one of you within those shared matches? because more than likely you are looking at a problem in one tree or the other. Thanks, Michelle. I think that question was from Judith. Um, so Judith, does that help if you're still with us? Judith, welcome to come back and add more detail if, if she wishes. Oh, she's no, she says yep. yes. Thank you. Yep, thank okay. you. Okay, Excellent. great. Um, and let me see if this works. Question two. All right. Um, how about this one, Michelle? So two mystery lines. Father was born in Ontario, Canada, 1919, to a British home child. Um, I have some of those in my ancestry as well. Um, father registered the birth in Thurlow Hastings. Uh, cousin, granddaughter of this man did a DNA test, and we are not related. Grandmother and dad returned to England in 1921. Okay, so let me just get this clear in my head. So the father was born in 1919. Um, and the granddaughter of the man born in 1919, is that correct, has taken a DNA test. So that's a close relative of yours. Is that, uh, maybe I'm not reading it right. Um, if, if, if someone as closely related as that has taken a test and they're not showing as a match, then again, there's possibly a problem within that genealogy. Um, mother's mother's father was born in Surrey to a servant from Sussex. No father named in the christening. Mother went back to her work, living in, and baby was a nurse child in the 1871 census. He later took his stepfather's surname, very, very common, served in the army, worked for the railway, and ended up with his family in and out of the workhouse. Last found on his own in 1913 in a Liverpool workhouse for one night coming off the streets. How can I begin to separate the unknown DNA matches? I have confirmed cousins on my father's mother's line and on my mother's father's line. So I'm able to separate those matches, but I'm left with a gazillion matches no closer than three generations. Okay, so what you need to do here is clustering these matches together into what we call genetic networks. Um, and it's again, it's looking at those shared matches. So particularly on Ancestry, where you can use the color coding system, you want to don't start with any really high matches, go a bit further down the list, start with matches, you know, maybe under, under 300 centimorgans, which it sounds like, like that's what you've got anyway. Um, and then just start looking at the shared matches and start creating color coded uh, groups. Um, and be very careful with it, but go into the shared match list and add all of the people on that shared match list with a mystery match, your best mystery match, if you like, um, to a particular group. 
add the same color to all those people and then go into them one by one and add any leftover people that are in their list that don't have the color to that group as well. Now you'll find the odd person that maybe doesn't belong in those groups and that's okay. You will find the odd mistake as you go through this process. And you will find the odd person who maybe has a double relationship or maybe belongs in two groups. It's not always neat and tidy, um, but just keep doing that until you've got a number of different groups. You can name them whatever you like. I tend to go alphabetical with my mystery group. I call them A group and B group and C group and D group. Um, and that way they're at the top of your list because the way that list organizes is alphabetical um, and then the key thing you need to do once you've got them into these uh, colored clusters is to then start family history research you have to go back to traditional research you have to build out the trees of all these shared matches in the different groups and try to find common ancestors between them once you've found a set of common ancestors within a group they're probably the common ancestors you're looking for, or a set of their parents perhaps are, depending on the relationships and how much DNA is shared in each instance. And just keep doing that. It's like a big giant jigsaw puzzle. I always say this, but it's one of those tatty ones that the box has been lost, all the pieces have been thrown in a plastic bag in a cupboard for years. There's bits missing um, and you're just trying to get one or two pieces on the board and then it will start to emerge. The picture will start to come back to life. But the pieces that you're putting on the board are these common ancestors that you can find within the shared match groups. And when you've got more than one mystery to solve within a family tree, you're not going to know which mystery the common ancestors pertain to at the beginning. But that's OK. Just keep working on them because eventually you're going to get to a point where, well, OK, this location corresponds more to this mystery, actually, than the other one. These people are in the right area. And as I build this tree forward for their children, oh, hang on a minute, uh, their son uh, went to exactly the same place that I'm looking for my mystery man to come from. That's the kind of uh, eureka moment that you're looking to have. And the key thing that you always want to do when you're building these trees forward, this descendancy research, is look at the spouses. Always look at the spouses and build their trees backwards as well to see if you can find any links in the DNA to the spouse's ancestors as well as uh, the common ancestral couple that you've identified from that cluster because maybe the spouse's uh, ancestors will form uh, one of the other color-coded groups you've created. I hope that helps uh, somewhat. <laughs> um, it isn't an easy process. It takes a lot of work, especially when you're looking for ancestors that are further back in time. You have to eliminate as many lines as you possibly can. Um, so again, also testing more people helps. Having more of the mystery DNA to work with, having more people tested on the other lines to help eliminate them helps as well. Um, there's, there's lots of different things you can try. Thanks, Michelle. Um, Patty? That was that was a question from you. If you're with us, um, would you like to say anything further to Michelle about that? Did that help? Maybe Patty's not here and she'll catch up later with the um, the recording. So, yeah, that's fine. OK, so we've got a few minutes left and um, I said if we had some time left, I asked Michelle if she would um, address my missing DNA well it, there's a DNA um there's an on pa a paper connection but there's no DNA connection between second cousins in my family and um I thought that it was some tools that I was missing I should, maybe I should be using chromosome painters I don't know I haven't spent enough time researching the um the clever bits and bobs that we can use for DNA research so I wondered if Michelle could give me some pointers on how to to go forward with that how to start finding so, where those MPs are yeah so I mean you've said it there yourself it's the same thing in that full second cousins will always share DNA with each other um that's simply so if they are full second cousins they would be sharing DNA so the fact that they're not sharing any DNA does suggest someone has a problem and again, you have to identify the problem before you can start looking for the mystery ancestors, because you need to know who's got the mystery ancestors. 
um, in the first place. So it's again going back to what I was saying in the first question, look at the shared matches. See if you can find any shared matches that do correspond to known ancestors on that line for either your dad or his second cousin. If one of you has matches to the known line, then you know it's the other one that has the MPE somewhere. So what if you've got no nobody to, to explore shared matches with. You mean no shared matches? Well, who would, who would I be looking for the, the shared matches between because the second cousins don't don't match and I don't have anybody confirmed on that line on my end. Yeah, that's it. You, it, it you're looking for anybody confirmed on that line on your dad's second cousin's end then. So if you're seeing nobody on that line, that's a pretty big red flag that mm. it's perhaps you that has the MPE. Um, but you need to know that people on that line have tested. Um, to be sure that it's you that's got the MPE. So do you have access to the second cousin's match list? No. So the second that be... cousin doesn't really want to discuss it. Right. OK. So you can't find out whether they've got matches or not. No. So in that case, I would be looking to see if I could test somebody else who might be more willing within the family to explore it, because that might help you get to the bottom of that. The other thing to be looking for is, well, are you seeing mystery matches, high ones that, that, that could correspond to a line that fits in your tree, but you, the ancestry doesn't match to yours? If you're seeing that, then those are good clues as to uh, what you might be looking for. And I would uh, start again with that clustering process, cluster that, those matches into a color-coded group and start looking at the shared matches and building out all the trees to find connections between the shared matches and yeah. if you are finding close matches uh, that simply don't correspond to your ancestry then you have to take a step back and think okay how could this person be fitting into my tree and is that person the close match are they willing to, to collaborate with you to find out the truth um, if they're willing to collaborate and find out the truth then maybe you'll be able to get access to their match list. Maybe they'll be able to tell you, well, you also match my third cousin from this line. And these are all my ancestors on this line. And I've got 10 matches to these people. And if that's the case, then those are the people you need to be looking at for your connection into this family. Uh, okay. So these are the kind of things that you want to check um, when you're trying to solve something like this. But you have to keep an open, as open a mind as possible uh, when it comes to potential misattributed parentage events. Um, but yeah, the two red flags are you're not matching somebody you absolutely should, which is second cousin or closer. Um, and you are you're finding reasonably high matches to ancestors that don't belong in your paper trail tree mm -hmm. those are the two red flags to having a, a mystery to solve like that thank you michelle um i've got lots of work to do <laughs> yeah. maybe when i retire ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay so um there's a question in the chat i'm just mm -hmm. trying to get ah there we go um my screen to stop sharing and it's a it's a YDNA question. Can you see that, Michelle? OK, hang on. I'll just go a bit up. Yeah, I can see that. So question in the chat says my dad had his YDNA tested at 37 markers and it turns out there must be an NPE somewhere down the line. On a positive note, there are lots and lots of matches with six having a genetic distance of one, but all of the six surnames are different. Any advice on how to progress with these matches? Oh, OK, Anna. So um, I have you come to the conclusion there's an NPE simply because the surnames are different? Because I would be very wary of doing that at 37 markers. If it's instead you're deciding it because uh, a close direct paternal male has tested and your dad doesn't match them, that's a different kettle of fish. Um, but 37 markers is quite low. It's an entry level test. Um, and if you've got six matches, 
uh, all at a genetic distance of one, I would want to see how these people match at 67 markers and at 111 markers, because they could easily drop off. These could be matches way, way, way back in time, pre-surname adoption. Um, so at 37 markers, you just can't know. And the only way to test two men at higher levels is for them both to upgrade to those higher levels. If, if you stay at 37 and some of them are at 67, just by upgrading your dad, you'll see how they match at 67. But if they're all only tested to 37, then they're all going to have to upgrade as well for you to see at 67 or 111. Um, if they drop off at 67 or 111, which I would expect some of them to do if they've all got different surnames, um, then it may be that he has no close matches. It may be that there isn't an NPE. It just depends on what you're basing that assumption on um uh you know if, if 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 i say his male first cousins tested and they're not matching each other then clearly that's a problem but it might be that it's the problems on the other side and not his so um i would be very wary of coming to any snap conclusions on 37 markers alone um but yeah i would want to upgrade but more than anything test autosomally and have a look at what whether there's any matches to his direct paternal line uh, autosomally, uh, not just his his father's father's line, but his father's mother's line as well. Let's see if you can if you if you're sure there's an NPE. Let's see if you can find out the generation it occurs on using the autosomal DNA. So Anna's replied that there's no matches to their surname, but lots of other surname matches. Right. Okay. So that's very common especially at 37 markers. So I would not, I would never ever uh, decide that there's a misattributed parentage event on the basis of a Y-DNA 37 marker test um, and seeing lots of different surnames. My own brother's uh, test, I mean, he's tested to 111 and big Y, but um, when he first tested and even up till now, there's not a single man with our surname that has tested. Um, it's just, we haven't been lucky with who has tested. Um, and my great grandfather was an only child. So I don't have anyone that I can also test, but at the same time, I have autosomal DNA matches going right back to my third great grandparents on that direct paternal line. So there's no NPE situation going back at least that far, if not further. Um, so the fact that you're not seeing your surname does not mean that there's definitely a misattributed parentage event. It could simply mean that the right people haven't yet tested and that all of these people could be matches many, many, many hundreds of years back in time prior to the adoption of surnames. Uh, so uh, I would uh, be wary of uh, reaching that conclusion from the lack of uh, surname matches. Why DNA testing still has many fewer people doing it. Um, many fewer people take a Y DNA test. So lots of people do end up with matches that don't have the same surname. And that's because Y DNA can reach so far back in time, up to 250,000 years, in fact. So you're going to get matches at 12 and 25 and 37, especially that have different surnames. You're going to get matches at 67 and even 111 with different surnames. Um, but if you have a close match at one 11 with a different surname, then that's much more something that you might want to look into, like a zero or a one, uh, but um, not at 37. Thanks, Michelle. Um, question from Karen. My husband has no Y DNA matches with the same name or close match, but does have an matches on ancestry. Yep. So Karen's saying what I'm saying as well, that um, oh. he's her husband has has matches to his direct paternal line on ancestry and that's great proof that there isn't a close misattributed parentage event and he's just again just like my brother he hasn't been lucky with his y dna matches yet of course some of those people with no matches on the same surname will have mpes but you can't guess that from the fact that there, there's no none of the same surname showing up um, at a 37 marker test Okay, so this is a, this is a long one from Michelle. Okay. <laughs> so Michelle says I have a little problem in that both of the matches that are high close matches are one parent families, and both of them have adoptions further up their lines. So I'm trying to match them to a DNA test, but all the trees that I'm trying to build and overlap are not corresponding with anything that is relevant to them and their names. I have found them on Facebook and I know all the connecting people that they chat to and I've built those trees back, but I'm struggling with finding out how to work out how the connection is made. 
Two matches are half brothers, uncle, nephew, distance. The other issue is that the DNA that they should match is also adopted and does not know the parents. But the trees that I'm building out for that DNA are not matching to the half brother, uncle, nephew. So is the answer to look at the chromosomes? I'm not quite sure from what you're saying, Michelle, as to what you're trying to do with these these two matches. Um, I can so they're, talk they're you it if you like. Yeah, please do. Um, okay. It's it's hard from reading that you know I'm I'm it, not sure what you're asking. I'm probably not describing it right. I've got <laughs> um, two separate half brother distance. So one of them is, I can't remember the exact figures, so I can look at it, but one of them is around about um, uh, 1,750. Uh, maybe the other one's slightly more or slightly less, I can't remember. So are, are they, who are these matches to? They're to a person that I'm trying to help to okay. solve the DNA for. Um, so I'm this, no expert, this, that's the problem. <laughs> so this person has an unknown father or grandfather or...? Well, the person that um, I'm trying to help is also adopted. It started out that right. she she wanted to find her parents. Right. And um, these two are... Oh, your sound is going, the, Michelle. Sorry, the distance <laughs> of the, the two matches um, came up, you know, when she put her DNA online. All right, so, so she's she's tested her DNA and she has two high matches in that 25% sharing bracket, that half sibling, aunt, uncle, niece, nephew, grandparent, grandchild bracket. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay, and, then, and do these two matches match each other? That's the other problem. One's on ancestry, one's on my heritage. So and I've you, looked at, there's only one person who also has matched on ancestry as well as my heritage. And that person only matches one of them he doesn't match the other one so I presume it's from one of his side if you know what I mean um, right so do, the person that, that has taken the test that you're trying to help do they not know who either of their parents are no, no. okay and they were adopted that's right yes so their first port of call absolutely should be adoption services to get their adoption papers they've they tried that and um, they've got a name but we can't find that name, and it's a co very, very common name. Okay, um, for the mother, I presume, and not the father. Yeah, exactly. And um, okay. the, the other problem is there are three significant places. Um, so I was looking at the places rather than the names as well, and um, mm -hmm. those three completely separate places of of um, where her tree that when she looks at her matches, her tree are um, very much based in Essex. Mm -hmm. One tree that's on my heritage is very much based in America. And the other tree is very much based in Cornwall. And she was born in Cornwall. So okay. we've so tried, to, we tried to build, actually we can't build Cornwall out, one out. All we can build out is the America and the London. So, um, and they don't match each other, and I've matched, I, I've only matched the one in America out by information on Facebook. Um, obviously, I haven't got his DNA, so I can't, um, can't build it out, but um, I've got some of his matches because he's on my heritage and they show who he matches to, but the other one um, has been very difficult because I can't build so many trees out for him. Okay, so I mean, at this point, since the two high matches are on two different sites, I wouldn't worry too much about whether they relate to each other yet. Um, it, it's, it's the same thing, go back to the basics. Look at the shared matches that the two high matches have, especially the one on Ancestry and see if you can work out, out that out first. Build out all the trees for all of the different shared matches. Um, there's got to be a connection somewhere unless that person too is adopted or has an unknown parentage mystery of their that's own the or a, an MPE. And if that's the problem, then you're going to have to look at lower matches. You know, many, many times I call them jackpot matches. Many, many times I've worked on a case, and I, you know, I've solved hundreds and hundreds of cases like this. And you look at the, the match list and you go, yay, haha, -ha, there's a jackpot match. This is going to be easy. And the jackpot match has uh, their father's not their father or they, they were adopted to and there's a big blank in their tree. And the blank is where 
your your person connects in if that's Sorry, the case to, if that's I'm the case then you in. have to you have to push past that person and go lower on the it's match the problem list. that they they're adopted higher up the line which is what i said in the script i can see that they're both adopted higher in the line but uh like you say i think i'm going to have to just build out more and more and more and more, more trees i can see very common names throughout both the um the, the the mixes of the trees i can see the, the same names on all three people they're mm -hmm. coming out again and again but the justice the, the link is so far back it's really difficult to see you know what well, that i mean with matches this high back, I know. yeah i know it should it can't be, be. Should be. <laughs> but it the can't link, be yeah sorry michelle the link should be at grandparent level or you know, or at the very most, great grandparent level. Yes, absolutely. But the problem is yeah. that the names are coming from much further back, so I'm not able to put the trees together. That's where I'm struggling. I'm mm -hmm. not able to get the the names to come forward um, because I'm building them out from the back to the forward. But um, from the Facebook one, I'm building it from the forward to the back because I'm going by the people that he's chatting to, and. Um, Right. Well, I, I would be very careful with that. You want, you know, you want to get into actual records. But that's um, all I've got with him. Yeah, I haven't got anything else. You, you go I understand, with what you've got, and, don't and, you? Yeah, yeah. and and, and yeah. You, you know, you have to be sure that you are looking at the right person. If it's a common exactly. name, it might not be the right person. So yeah, exactly. uh, that's another problem. But yeah, I it's all about clustering those groups of matches together and building out every single tree that you can to I'll find common ancestors it. within the clusters. That's I'll the only working. way. And it's time consuming. And sometimes you just don't have the right matches yet to get to the no bottom problem. of something. Thanks very much, Michelle. Okay. Thank you both. Um, we've just gone slightly over the a little over time. <laughs> just a little bit. Um, so I'm I'm gonna save the two questions that we've had in um, mm -hmm. just now for to to ask you them offline. If you could answer them later, Michelle, um, that would be great. So yeah, that's fine. Or or during the panel later on, I can answer them then if that's yes. That would be that would be a, a good a good thing to do. Um, sorry, I didn't show your poll earlier on. So I'm going to, to do that now. So on your screen is, is Michelle's poll. Have you or a close family member had your DNA tested for genealogy research purposes? And if you have, which service did you use? If you answered yes to the above, how did you find the experience? Okay. So the polling is slowing right down, but because um, it's a bit of a long one, I'm going to give people a little bit more time to finish that. Okay, nobody's nobody else is voting, so I'm going no, to end the polling. Please, the problem is if you say no, you can't submit. Really? Yep. Well, I couldn't anyway. Well, that's an unpleasant glitch from zoom isn't it hmm. i'd just blame eric it's probably user error <laughs> <laughs> it's requiring you to answer the second question which is void if you've answered no to the first uh, ah, yep. same go. here mm. well no, no, if you transfer from um ancestry to the others where does that fit in because i haven't tested with living dna but I've imported my data. I think this is just a question about straight up testing who you tested with. I think if we try to, to get 
drill down to that level. <laughs> I think, and I don't think Zoom would be able to cope with it if it won't let you submit if you want to know anyway. I think um, I'm going to share the results anyway, and um, we'll see what we've got from the, the number of people who were able to submit. I know it's not a, a, a great reflection of the sample that we've um, that we've asked, but most people maybe as expected um, yeah. tested with Ancestry. Is that something you find, Michelle? Uh, yeah, I mean, that it has by far the largest database. So you've got to expect that more people are going to have tested with Ancestry than, than anywhere else. And, and that makes sense. It's nice to see that, that, that the, the largest number of people who have uh, answered the second question said that they great, they've got a lot of work to do, but they're making new discoveries all the time. And I think that that's the key, that you're going to get new matches all the time and you're going to be able to make new discoveries all the time. Yeah. Still a lot of people not sure how to get the most out of their results, though. Um, so there's lots and lots of education and help out there, which, again, we can talk a bit about in the panel if people want. But um, I'm, I'm conscious that we're over time and um, uh, you need to move on from the DNA section now. Yes, thank you. OK, um, so I'm going to go back to um, sharing my screen and move on to Elsa, Elsa Churchill from the Society of Genealogists. So thank you, Michelle, for that. And um, bear with Thanks, me while Denise. I thank you. share my screen. And here we go. Hello, my name is Elsa Churchill and I am the genealogist at the Society of Genealogists. The Society of Genealogists is the UK's largest and oldest genealogical member society with an extensive library and archive currently in central London near the Barbican. Our digital collections are called SOG Data Online and are made available to our members via our website, sog.org.uk. However, non-members can use the free purple search box found on several pages of the website to make free searches to see if there's anything that might be of interest. But you need to be a full or associate member to view the full image or index entry. Essentially, the Society's digital collections are a snapshot of the things we hold in the library. Not everything in the library is ours to publish, so SOG Data Online includes some of the unique databases and indexes to records that are in our archives and which belong to us. Sometimes we've uploaded images to browse through relating to items that are not yet indexed into the database, such as images of old card indexes and documents from the archives. We've also uploaded images of books held in the library, so they can be read online from home, especially if they were published before 1900 and contain lots of genealogical names and interests. Some very few of our larger data sets are also online in partnership with the website Find My Past, so that we can raise revenue to keep conserving and indexing our library collections. However, all the society's digital collections are on SOG data online and are exclusively available to our members. The best place to begin using SOG data online is via the search records tab on the website. This can be helpful if you're a member or not a member of the society. This opens up pages where you can find help in searching the database and guides to tell you what's included. There are millions of names and thousands of items on SOG data online, far more than, far more than I can have time to go through today. So I'll just give you some highlights. Remember, the purple search box lets you search the databases using simple or advanced searches, and you can also browse through the subject categories of records and sources that we've uploaded. Non-members can browse the data sets to see what's there and make some limited searches within data sets, but you do have to be a member and be logged into the members area of the website to view the full index data or to see any images, whether they've been indexed or not. Browsing through the records arranged in subject order shows we have all sorts of items and sources from almanacs, directories, education records, monumental inscriptions, occupations, parish registers, poll books, wills, etc. This subject arrangement on SOG Data Online is very similar to the way the Society's library is arranged. Some of the older, rare and out of print books have been uploaded onto SOG Data, such as this 18th century almanac called the Royal Calendar for the year 1776. When we uploaded a book from the library onto SOG Data Online, we make a note in our free online library catalogue. And if you see the blue globe icon in the library catalogue and you're logged in 
as an SOG member, then that globe button will link you directly to the book and SOG data online. Some of the uploaded books include published transcripts of parish registers, which are now out of copyright, or copies of published school records, such as this list of students who attended Bradfield College. Having scanned and uploaded a book onto SOG Data Online, our members can volunteer to index the names in the work into the database to make it easier to use. A team of volunteers have been indexing the names in our remarkable collection of 18th and 19th century poll books that show where your ancestors lived and what they did and how they voted. Indexing the names adds value to the whole database and means you can search across all the poll books online, but you can also search page by page with an individual poll book should you wish. Some of our most important collections were created by Percival Boyd, an early member of the society who compiled large indexes to various records using manual typewriters in the days before computers. Boyd's Inhabitants of London contained some 60,000 group sheets like this, containing notes from many sources related to London families, largely from the 16th to the 18th century. Note the handwriting and the number in the top right hand page of each sheet. Many other books in the Society of Genealogists Library are annotated with that distinctive handwriting of Percival Boyd. And if you see those number references in a book in our library, you can search Boyd's inhabitants on SOG data online by that reference number to find the exact page that you want. Boyd's family units has similar pages of notes, but for families outside London. Boyd's Marriage Index is a data set of over 7 million entries from, the, from series one and two of the TypeScript volumes compiled by Boyd's and his team. Note that series three isn't our copyright to upload, and so series three is not online on SOG Data Online. Often the entries that uh, Boyd and his team compiled were taken from printed volumes, such as the Philemore Marriage series and other books. But you'll also see uh, not only entries from parish registers, but from marriage licenses indexed in Boyd's marriage index. The digitized local collections on SOG data online include, for example, an index to names in the 1837 tithe map for Barrow in Cheshire. And here the digital local collections for Staffordshire include abstracts of some 279 wills, which were taken from the Newcastle under Lyme Manor Court, which it seems copies have been deposited there. And these were transcribed for the society by Peter Roden. One of our more recent acquisitions was a manuscript poll book of the third Liverpool Boys Brigade Company showing Boys Brigade members for the years 1940 to 1954. This item is catalogued in the library catalogue and you can link to it in SOG data online within the Lancashire local records by using the globe icon that you can see in the catalogue entry here. We featured these records in the recent March 2021 issue of our magazine, The Genealogist magazine. Two of our members, Jeff and Dice Winfield, undertook to research the boys listed in the role to see who had died and therefore could have their information published online and who we would need to redact from the record because they were still alive or less than 100 years old. This created a pilot for us to see if we could create an ongoing live database of records which redacted records and updated in real time and we were very excited to find we could do. The Society of Genealogists Library contains many biographical um, books and material on those who served in the army. With this data set compiled by one of our members, Nicholas Newington Irving, over many years, lists some of the names for which biographical information exists in books and periodicals, for example, and shows where it can be found in the books in our collection. Our indexing volunteers can draw out the genealogical value of all sorts of unusual items. For example, we hold a set of sales catalogues created by James Coleman, who was an heraldic and genealogical bookseller and publisher in London in the second half of the 19th century. As a second-hand dealer, he sold all sorts of manuscripts in ephemera, such as marriage settlements, wills, rent rolls, peerage claims, private and local acts of parliaments, appeal cases, pedigrees, deeds, autograph letters, maps, and so on, as well as new and second-hand books on heraldry, topography, and biography. 
His sales catalogues give brief details of the items for sale between 1859 and 1911. Many of the catalogue entries were quite detailed, naming the people in the document. So even if that document may have ended up as a decorative lampshade or hanging on a pub wall, our online index at least gives a clue as to the existence of the documents and a, an idea of what it might have contained. Frederick Arthur Crisp was another antiquarian collector of documents, and we hold his original collection of apprentice indentures. Another digital apprentice collection is known to the Society of Genealogies as Apprentices of Great Britain. One of the SOG's first indexing projects after we were founded in 1911 was to abstract the records of the tax levied on apprenticeships between 1710 and 1811. They've been discovered by a member of the society in the inland revenue records. We lobbied for those records to be housed by the then public record office and hence these tax records on apprenticeships became the IR1 series of records. In addition to the SOG indexes to marriage license allegations issued by the Archbishop of Canterbury's faculty and vicar general offices, the digital marriage license section on SOG data online contains some rare examples of original licenses collected again by the antiquarian Frederick Arthur Crisp. During his lifetime, Chris built up a collection of over 20,000 original marriage licenses that he obtained directly or indirectly, as he said, from parish clerks of various London churches. These were bound into 221 volumes and abstracts were made of all the genealogical content. And the abstracts of these sit in the, on the London shelves in the library. On his death, the original licenses were dispersed, but some 38 volumes of these original records are now held at the SOG's library. And we, we thought it'd be interesting to put them online and index them um, together with the, with the images of the volumes themselves. While the Society of Genealogists is not a formal archive, it is often an archive of last resort, taking in original records and documents that no other archive wanted but which we felt were of use and interest to family historians and where our indexing volunteers could add genealogical value. Such was the collection of personnel registers relating to customs and excise officers born between 1833 and 1911. It shows when the officer was appointed, the stations they worked in around the coast and any promotions or misdemeanors that occurred during their service. The National Archives held the pension records of customs and excise officers and felt they didn't need to take these personnel ledgers, but we felt there was genealogical value in the records, especially as the pension records at TNA haven't yet been indexed online, so we digitised the ledgers and indexed them and put them online. The registers of the Teachers Registration Council were a similar unwanted set of, of records that could find no official archive home, so we took them in. The Teachers Registration Council material on SOG data online shows those teachers who registered with the council after it was first founded in 1902 up to 1948. The registers record where the teacher trained and served. Note in the results um, section, if a place and county uh, have been given a globe link, we've linked that place to Google Maps so you can get a feel of what the place is that, that's mentioned. Another uh, set of records that we took in were the petitions of the Trinity House Charity, which record the applications for assistance between 1787 and 1854 from dis destitute families of merchant mariners who had died or who'd been captured as prisoners in the Napoleonic Wars. Luckily, these name rich petitions came to the society in the 1930s before much of the Trinity House archive itself was severely damaged during the war. The remaining Trinity House records are now in the London Metropolitan Archives. As yet, only the uh, name index to the petitions is on SOG data online, and we hope to match the index up to scanned images of the petitions in due course. But until then, you can apply to the Society to order copies of the documents via our website, and these can be sent to you as, as uh, photocopies or scanned images. The Bank of England archive disposed of its collection of will abstracts made between 1717 and 1845, and which show extracts of wills of those who died with monies in public funds, as well as abstracts of orders made for stockholders who went bankrupt or who were declared lunatic. 
This was the SOG's first major volunteer computing indexing project, and um, it took us a bit of what, a time to, to uh, connect the old index with uh, newly scanned images of the documents, but eventually they came together and both are now on SOG data online. Some of our projects are, um, contain interesting material from wills. Uh, for example, we have uh, within our library abstracts and copies uh, of lots of Devon wills. And considering the original wills for Devon before 1858 were damaged and destroyed in the 1942 raids on Exeter during the war, um, this contribution towards um, information about the missing wills where abstracts and copies have been uh, found in our library is remarkable. There's plenty more items from the SOG library and archives that we would like to scan and index onto SOG data online. However, the digitization project is coming along at pace, particularly as our volunteers can work from home and add value to images of the records or card indexes or books that we have uploaded. The pandemic lockdown gave many of our members the impetus to join our volunteer projects. They've been able to communicate with each other via an online forum and the support of our volunteer manager. We have been really excited to see how the online volunteers support each other, ask and ask, answer questions and talk and collaborate together. While many of our volunteers are members keen to give something back to the genealogical community, not all are members, and we have volunteers from all age ranges and backgrounds working on our digital collections. We have volunteers scanning our document collection and miscellaneous manuscript research notes, working on thousands of boxes from our special collections, converting millions of slips from old card indexes, such as the Great Card Index and the Berno Index, which are both huge miscellaneous indexes drawn from many genealogical sources and especially useful for finding names from the 17th, 18th centuries. A team of volunteers is working at home, scanning and making JADCOM abstracts of the thousands of manuscripts, role pedigrees and family trees from the archives. The first tranche of these pedigrees will be online soon. And of course, we still have thousands of books we'd like to make available to members to read online, especially the thousands of compiled family histories and books which are rich in names. So to recap, the online digital collections in SOG Data Online are but a snapshot of some of the wonderful books, documents and collections held in the Society of Genealogists Library. The SOG digital data isn't as vast as that of the major commercial genealogy websites, but it reflects all sorts of unique and wonderful records that would not exist for family historians at all if it were not for the Society of Genealogists and its volunteers. There's still much more to come. Do visit the SOG's website, sog.org.uk, and make a free search to see if there's an online database that might be of interest to you. And you will, of course, find information on our website about joining the Society and accessing this rich data from home. Sorry, um, thank you, Elsa, for that. And um, we'll return to the room for your poll. I, I must apologise as well, it, this is not a Zoom error. It turns out if this is a, a human error. So um, the, the person who created the, um, the DNA genealogy research poll neglected to put an option on the second question for if your answer was no. So I must apologize to Eric and I must apologize to Zoom as well. Um, but here we go for Elsa's poll. Before today, had you heard of the Society of Genealogists? And have you visited the Society's website to either use the data or the catalogue or for general information? Oh, wow. Okay, so I think the majority of people who are here have voted. The voting has slowed 
right down. So I'm going to end the polling and share the results on the screen. So most of us have heard of the society, um, but some of us are yet to visit. <laughs> I've got well, it's a bit more, well, the website's always there. Do, do go and have a look. Um, so it's been a little bit more of a challenge to visit. We, we opened formally last Tuesday again to, uh, after lockdown. Yeah, so it's been good to, um, to have your volunteers able to work from home on your projects. During yeah, the pandemic. It, 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 they always say that it's three years of tech development in three weeks over lockdown. It certainly was the same was the case for us. <laughs> so um, Abby's question to you, Elsa, is how much does it cost and how can we pay? We have two types of membership. We have full and associate. And I think for most people, if they particularly just want to use the digital collections, the associate membership is what you need to do and you can find that on our website sog.org.uk and I'll put the link in the, in the chat for you. Um, the associate membership is um, £56 a year uh, and that's really gained for those who, don't, who aren't really using the library that much but really want to use the, the digital collections. A full membership uh, gives access to the digital collections, free use of the library, voting rights etc and that's £80 a year but I'll put the link here if anyone wants to know more about it in the chat. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Elsa on the Society of Genealogy, uh, Genealogists? Elsa is the genealogist at the Society. That's right, isn't it? It is, yes, but that translates as dogs and body, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> well, it also gives you an, a unique insight into what's held in the Data Online Library. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is only a snapshot of what we have at the moment. We dearly love to put everything up there, but um, it's, it's like any library, you can only put what's yours and not, you know, not, not somebody else's uh, intellectual property. So we're, we're getting there slowly. And, and virtually everything that's been put up has been put up by volunteer effort. Um, we're realising we might have to, to branch out from that there, but it's been, uh, you know, it's been our members and, our, and other volunteers that have come in to make those, those things available for us. So on the theme of open data, um, how possible is it for the society to collaborate with other interested um, and similar organisations? Well, I mean, obviously, like anyone else, we've got to pay the bills and we have staff. And so, you know, we've got to have some income from somewhere. But there's a, you know, like, I think there's a, there's a happy medium to know you've got stuff, but you make as much as you can available to let people know what there is. Obviously, the catalogue's free. The, um, and, you know, that was paid for by a Heritage Lottery grant 20 years ago on the, on the proviso that a catalogue would always be free and available to, to anyone. But who wouldn't have their library catalogue freely available because it's to tell people what you have. Um, and we're working to put the library catalogue on other platforms like WorldCat, et cetera, which are better accessible by Google. So that, that tells the people, you know, what, what you have. And to say, I, I think most people don't realise that you can make some free searches on the, on the digital collections just to see what there is and to get, a clear, you know, at least it's a compromise to say, well, don't waste your money until you know there's something there you want to look at. I think that's the that's the compromise we make to try to continue for another hundred years. Yeah. <laughs> and Kath observes that talks during lockdown have been really appreciated. Thank you. Yes, yeah, that's, yeah we would be the, we um, learned a lot and uh, they're going well. <laughs> okay, well, I think that's, that's it for the questions on the Society of Genealogists. So um, we'll move to the panel and open up the floor to, um, to all of the speakers from today and trustees from Free UK Genealogy. Um, Pat Reynolds is here, our executive director, and um, we'll take your questions. And, and I know there were a few left over from Michelle's Q&A. So do you want to start with one of them, Michelle? Yeah, that would be fine. Um, let's just see where are the ones that we need. So Andrew says, I have an eight. I'm not sure what 
that is, but I have a misalignment between surname and Y DNA matching. A half dozen people of my surname have tested, but they are all different haplogroups. Um, so what I would want to know from that is when you say a half dozen people of your surname, are these all people on your direct line that have tested? Because um, then that would be a problem if they all have different haplogroups. But if it's just men with your surname, then um, uh, that, that's a different kettle of fish. Uh, my own Y111 matches five people all with the name Wilkinson. Does this suggest an NPE in my line? Again, um, a, a consistency of five people like that at 111 um, is suggestive of something, but it depends on the genetic distance. If they're all at, you know, eight, nine, and 10, then it, it could still be pre-surname adoption. Um, but if they're at a genetic distance of one or two or zero, um, then yes, I would be suspecting that perhaps uh, you have a surname disconnect. It doesn't have to be misattributed parentage event. It could be a surname change. It could be an illegitimacy, anything further back in the line um, at some point that maybe there's a Wilkinson male involved, but it is all dependent on um, genetic distance and uh, who has tested and whether or not you've got any males on your specific direct line who have tested or not. Thanks for that, Michelle. Um, and then there was one from Karen. Karen. Um, so if you upgrade from 37 to 67 and Y DNA test, how long to wait for results? Uh, how long is a piece of string sometimes? But it just depends on... Um, how busy they are at the time you upgrade. If it's a time where there's a sale on upgrades and there's a lot of different upgrades, it might take a bit longer. But generally, it's a little bit quicker than when you do a, a test for the first time because you don't have the waiting for the test sample to reach the, the, the company and get to the lab and all of that. They've already got the sample there in the lab. So it should take a bit less time than that, but it will still take a number of weeks. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I had a direct message in from Sue to say that the Family Tree Magazine Masterclass that you led was most useful at sorting out matches. So is that still available for those of us who need to do some serious work on sorting our matches out? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I did a, a, a Family Tree Magazine DNA boot camp, a six week boot camp. So that's what it was. Um, it ran from uh, start of February to middle of March uh, this year. And those who had uh, uh, bought a ticket to the boot camp still have access to it at the moment, but it will be uh, coming down at the three month mark. Um, however, I am going to be doing a second edition of it. So um, a bit of breaking news. Um, and that is going to start in September, the 29th of September, in fact. So anyone who missed it and does want to do it, uh, keep an eye on my Facebook page, my Twitter, et cetera. Keep an eye on Family Tree Magazine um, and there'll be definite details about uh, uh, the DNA Bootcamp coming back in September. Uh, and not to dwell on this for too long, but is it an hour a week or is it full time? Yeah, no, no, it's not. It's it's not full time. Uh, so, I mean, you can put in as much as you like to it, but uh, it it. For what we did uh, in February, March, it was 6.30 to 8 o'clock for the webinar weeks. And then the next week, we would have catch-up sessions, which were just half an hour sessions. How are people getting on? What are your questions about the, the learning from this week? And then we'd go on to the next week. We'd have our hour and a half again, where I'm doing the teaching. And they'd have the recording so they could uh, catch up and stop and start and try things out. There would be tasks, you know, optional homework, if you like. Um, and then again, the week after that, it would be a, ca a half hour catch-up uh, you know, Q and A, uh, chat over the tasks and everything that that, that they've been doing. Um, so there's there's basically three you know hour and a half sessions and three half an hour catch up sessions uh, within the. But uh, what we're going to do in September is uh, extend it to eight weeks so that it, it might be an hour for the webinar session instead of an hour and a half. We'll see how it goes. But I wanted to spread it out a little more because it, it was quite concentrated. As a boot camp, is, 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 uh, you know, suggests. <laughs> yeah. There was lots of notes that went with it as well. 
there there is um there, there's a copious handout uh, information for people yeah. to pour over if they wish <laughs> but they like i said the tasks and the homework and the handouts and all of that stuff is optional it, you put in as much as you want to yeah. in these things and i guess because um it would have taken a lot of work to develop the, the course that it, does, it will cost some money it won't be um yes it's not course. it's not a free course but it, it it was it was a very very uh decent price last time um i'm not sure what family tree magazine are thinking of so i won't say it's definitely going to cost this but um it certainly was very affordable lovely thank you for that michelle any questions for any of our other speakers so first of all we had guy and josh from the Turing institute talking about the um project living with machines and then we had sarah callis talking about WikiTree and then it was michelle and elsa so um if any more questions are going to come in for the panel um then that would be great but we had a question on um twitter from uh daniel maldonado and in fact it was two questions and so i said that i would ask the panel if we had some time I would love to hear any thoughts on finding someone's death record when they seem to just disappear. I've had it happen several times in my family and it's driving me nuts. So um, first of all, would any of our really experienced genealogists like to take that question? Well, you think there's a bit more information than that, but uh, if you can't find something, it implies you either don't have all the information you, th you thought you had in the first place, or that it occurred at another place or another time than you expected. Um, uh, it's difficult not, I'm just about to be visited by a cat, sorry. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's difficult not to, reg to register a death. Uh, you've got a body to sort out. But most of the time, we, you're probably if, you know, expecting it to, to be registered. I remember it's, it's the place where it's registered. Um, it, it might be in a different place that you expect. Um, it's not inconceivable that people do go overseas or even cross the border to Scotland. So you might need to broaden your search wherever it is. And of course, you know, answering this question really depends on, on you know, the background information, when and where would you expect it to be and how can you broaden it? But uh, it's, and also remember who's, who's registering a death. It's, it, it may not be someone who is familiar with that person as you expect. So be flexible if the age you know, be flexible with an age that might be reported with death because the informant might not have exactly known when that, how old that person was. So be prepared to broaden your search parameters when you're searching for something that has ambiguity of information like that. Yeah, I guess I, there's, a, there's a multitude of places that we don't think to look because we yeah. have our eyes yeah. on one kind of um set of assumptions yeah. yeah i would i would also i would also add that from a sorry sorry michelle from a free bmd and free uk genealogy point of view obviously we have free reg which has got the data there um but free bmd one of the searches that is often overlooked is that you can do a death search and you can say death search from someone who was born in this year plus or minus whatever and as you go through the years because obviously if you're doing an age search of if you're looking at the age of death, the age of death will change every year, um, mm. depending on where they go. So it's, it's quite a difficult search to do. But um, we can do that inside FreeBMD. You can say, um, show me everyone who died within the, on this year, plus or minus a certain number of years. And it will search the whole database and give you that, that range automatically. I answered him a little bit on Twitter on this and, and it, it was the same as Elsa really that it's such an open-ended question that it, it depends on the where and the when um, for instance he, you know he could be asking about a death in Scotland in the 1840s when death reporting was exceptionally sparse um, so you know you have to think about the when and the where and you have to keep a really open mind on ages names uh, spelling variants mistranscriptions on indexes uh, one uh, example I wanted to give was recently I was struggling to find a death record um, for this man and he had a you know common ish name but not too common and he'd lived in a small place and I knew that he was there in 1901 he was dead before 1911 and that he almost certainly died in this place I couldn't find him and I did a search without any surname in the end and he had been 
his uh, death had been mistranscribed, his name had been put down as his occupation. So he was a Mason. So instead of his name being, yeah. you know, John Fraser, it was his Fraser was put down as a middle name, John Fraser Mason. But of course, Mason was his occupation, not his name. Yeah. Um, and so things like that can throw yeah. people off, you know, just uh, silly little things like that. Yeah. Somebody has just mistranscribed it and put his occupation okay. as a surname. Um, so yeah, just keep as open a mind as possible in all of the different permutations. And, you know, people do disappear and change their name and emigrate and get in ships and, you know, um, all sorts of things uh, could happen. Yeah. Uh, and Andrew, as Andrew says in the chat, you know, search as many different databases even if they claim to have the same data there's different ways of searching it different functionality different transcriptions um just broaden your search to as many different places to search and india is a good a good suggestion too um you know, over, you know, you know overseas generally we all we, we think our ancestors are very you know fixed but the little little devils will travel and uh, <laughs> we had quite a wide empire to, to travel in india and Australia, New Zealand, that's just the, you know, the Anglophone places, let alone all the, and we're only, I, li I live 20 miles from France, you know, my, ne my nearest shopping centre is Calais, so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You've got your wellies on. Yeah, you know, so people move. <laughs> and so um, Daniel's second question was um, about finding photos related to branches which have died out. Oh, social media is the best place to look. Thanks. Now. The, the amount of photographic stuff that's getting on the internet and social media. You should be on a Facebook group for every community where your ancestors come from and you know, schools that your ancestors attended. I've got some fantastic school pictures from my um, grandfather and great grandfather's schools and villages. Yeah. Um, and the kids hate Facebook, but we really ought to be on it. <laughs> um, and I guess newspapers. Yeah. Just to look. And just trying to make contact with with living collateral yeah. line relatives oh, who are, might have photos that you don't. You know, yeah. I just got sent one this week that brought a tear to my eye. Mm. Um, I would never have had that photo, but uh, this person took a DNA test and I reached out to them and yeah. they were like, hey, have you ever yeah. seen this? So, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. obviously um, uh, reach out to, to living relatives who might have photos you don't. Oh, yes. On, on, on the photo one, I I. I contact I got contacted by a DNA relative who sent me a photo of my my great great grandfather and he was in army uniform and everything I had from him at the censuses he was a laborer and he was a carman but actually it turned out that he was in the army for seven years between censuses I had absolutely no idea at all it gave me a huge amount of information about him. Wow um, so we had a few questions left over from um, the talks earlier on and we've got one from Humphrey Suttle to um, Josh and Guy. So I am trying to understand how you were using the GB1900 data, given that it names and provides coordinates for only about half of the streets in towns. Humphrey actually directed the GB1900 project. So um, I think he's got a specific interest in this area. Over to Guy and Josh, I think your mic's off, Guy, if you're... Can it take this? I can't see Josh on this. Oh, I, I, I can reply to, to that one if guys have information. I, I, I sent uh, I sent Humphrey a, a direct message. I, I tried as best as possible to send direct messages to any any questions that we didn't get to before. But um, yeah, <laughs> absolutely right that we're we're not capturing all the uh, yeah because I think I said that this the uh, the maps that the GB nineteen hundred project was. Uh, uh, using with a six, six inch ordnance survey maps and so um, uh, not all that particularly small streets don't have their names written on that map so obviously if the text isn't on the map and that's not in GB 1900 um, that disproportionately affects small streets um, so as I think I sort of said earlier that the work on the TNA street indexes is um, it's it's purely so that we can release the data, we can release some geocoded street data. Um, it's not gonna be the most comprehensive and best data set we have to analyze um, the census data by place to answer some of the research questions we have. Um, 
because we'll have to we'll be using like the ISM data set for that. It's just it, it's a way that we we can we can we can do some analyses on the TNA Street Index data. But the key thing is we can release that, and then people can build on that. They can you know, um, but the point is at the moment there is no geolocated census street data out there. Whereas you know there there will be when when we can release that. Excellent. And Linda asked, how will you make sure you're linking the correct people? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to come in on that one. Um, so, I, I mean, that the way we do that is, is we do it in lots of different ways. Um, so we, we try and use a combination of um, sort of machine learning algorithms, which allows us to do this at scale. Um, and then we, we check this uh, using specific cases to, to check that we know what it's basically what it's doing and how it's matching. Um, so it's a combination really of combining different techniques um, in order to ensure that we get the, the most rigorous, um, the, the most sort of refined data set as possible. So it's not going to be perfect 100% of the time. Um, and that's where sort of us coming back to, to analyze it sort of can identify some of those issues and help us in, improve it going forward. Um, so it, it's really a case of, of combining sort of these these computational methods that we we rely on um with with sort of elbow grease and, and human effort to to do other aspects as, as well i don't know if Josh wants to add anything to that or if that sort of covers where we're at yeah no that uh i think that pretty much covers everything i would, I would say um uh basically there's a lot more work for us to, to do in this area, essentially, Guy and I relatively recently joined the Living Machines project, and the census work is just starting to come online. You know, as we've joined it, so um, there's some existing work that's been done with the matching and algorithms that's been developed um, for for work in different areas of the project, and we're we're only just starting to apply that or like adapt that for for work on census linking people. So. Um, uh, so yeah, we're just yeah, we'd love to uh, be able to sort of report back at a later stage when we've um, got got some more stuff to show us. Can I ask a question? Have you any analysis of how your algorithms compare to those used by the other the commercial companies that offer hints and links themselves? Sorry. Uh... As of, sorry, this is the, the issue of both of us coming to answer the question. Um, as of yet, no, uh, simply because we haven't run this at a broad enough scale to specifically using algorithm matching. We haven't run a broad enough scale to, to really having parity yet. Um, and there's also the question of how much of the commercial company sort of algorithm we're going to be able to have access to, because if it's commercially uh, valuable, then I imagine we're, we're going to have difficulties with looking at how they calculate things differently. So it's it's definitely on the agenda. It's something we're looking to do. Uh, but at this stage, we haven't got sort of a, a, a matching percentage sort of comparator that we can, can share. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alexander, uh, uh, sorry, Alexandra Everly, um, one of our trustees says, are there other kinds of genealogical data beyond the census that it would be particularly valuable for your work as open slash link data or which is currently only available under commercial license. Sorry, was was that for us? Um, yeah, sorry, I, I didn't say did I? So that was that was directed to Josh and Guy. Okay. Um, yes, we are. We are, and as we've talked about to an extent, you know, we are really keen on linking different records and linking different data sets together to see what we can produce. Um, and as I think it corresponds quite nicely today, things like birth, marriage and death records, uh, sort of free BMD is, is something that's incredibly value, valuable for us as well. So having that type of open data um, is really important. And, and really, we are, we are keen to link together as many different things as possible. Um, so there are all sorts of records that might be of use to family historians that can be of use for us as well. If, if we can create those linkages, hopefully we can create something that has um, value for, for everyone in, involved. And is, is there any that is only currently available under commercial license, I think is part of Alexandra's question. I mean, there's lots of, there, there are lots of 
sources that have, they might not have been indexed or transcribed but there's lots of certainly digitized images of sources on sites like ancestry that i would love to be able to use um at scale like pro like in probate records um there, there are tax records all, all this stuff that could add you know lots you know, sort of flesh out information about people's lives um that that yeah has been kind of yeah they've taken photos of it um and and it's on on, on these sites behind paywalls and it'd be great you know to be able to run handwritten text recognition um uh software on that sorry if my i'm breaking up a bit i my um, take keeps going off cutting in and out um but yeah um there's lot yeah there's lots of things like that tax records probate records that are uh, on those sites that it'd be great to have access to or have have more open access to okay um i've got another one here for you too Guys, presumably you could track an address over time and inhabitants. I have in mind workhouse, not in the individual houses. The difficulty is that in Bristol, for example, there were around 2,500 inmates and staff. It would be interesting to see how the population of the Institute, um, I don't have any more question there. Um, I guess is it, the, the end of that would be about how that changed over time. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there is some work uh, not on living with machines going on on workhouses, I think, at, at the moment, um, which or, or specifically using the census with, work, with workhouses, which will be really interesting. But yeah, this, this whole, whole idea of um, sort of understanding how places, be that a street, be that an area, be that a town, changes over time is something that's, that's really fascinating. So some of the work that I'm doing at the minute is trying to understand um, industrial character and how certain places develop a certain reputation for uh, producing bicycles or cloth or lace or, or something, you know, any, anything you can really think of. So once we can start making these um, geographic linkages and, and having them on different scales as well is also something that's really important. Being able to differentiate between streets and being to be able to differentiate between sort of zones in a, a city, for example, um, is something that opens up a whole lot of possibilities for, for us to um, explore different factors. And, you know, living with machines is not the only sort of project that work, is working on this type of thing. There's some fantastic work out there already. Um, but it's also an area where there's lots and lots of things left to do. So things like the history of an address um, are interesting both on a, a family history level of, of, you know, who lived in this house over the years, but they also allow us to undertake broader research questions um, ab about sort of uh, space and, ge and geographies more generally. Thank you very much. Um, and I think last one from Zach, another question for the Living With Machines team. I'm a techie and a data guy and love genealogy too. Uh, Zach, as an aside, you sound perfect for UK genealogy, so get in touch, yeah. Um, could you give a quick breakdown of the tech you're using for data collection and relationships slash data connections, et cetera, please? For example, graph database or matching algorithms? Maybe I mean guys, the one who's linking records in terms of in 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 certain ways. Maybe I could just say just um, the work I've done so far on you know, that I've sort of shown with the the geocoding work linking between GB nine hundred nine hundred stuff like that. Um, that that's fairly like, simple. Just um, using blocking indexes and um, you know, sort of fuzzy string matching. There's nothing. I haven't run any kind of pre-train. Like I'm not, we're not using. I haven't used training data sets. Um, uh, and, then, and then used um, um, matching algorithms on, on that work. Um, guys, there was a bit more sort of linking work using using other methods. Um. Yeah, so um, I, I would highlight to, to start off with that the, the linking I've been doing has primarily been in terms of place rather than in terms of individuals. Um, and obviously that's that's something we're, we're working on, but we're at fairly early, early stage with the, the individual aspect. Um, in terms of, of place, it's, it's generally been um, mainly in, in Python, um, building specifically using Pandas at the minute to, to aggregate on a, on a large scale. Um, and then we're starting to build that into a, a more generalized like Python model, um, which uh, tracks certain changes over time and, and tracks changes in, in certain places over time. Um, 
so uh, I'm afraid I don't have anything to, to share in terms of, of matching algorithms yet, um, primarily because they, they've not been the focus of the work. Living with Machines has developed something called the, the DZ uh, matching algorithm. Uh, it's something that has been used in other contexts, specifically newspapers, um, and we're, we're thinking about how we might apply that in, in a census context. Um, the, if you're interested in this type of things, we do have a GitHub um, and we, we do share some of the code that we develop on, on the project on, on the GitHub. So if you're interested in, in these types of things um, and potentially want to keep an eye out for, for stuff going on in that area in the future, um, I'd recommend keeping an eye on that. And, and we, we do periodically release things publicly on there as well. This is Zach. Thanks so much for that. I'll take a look at the GitHub. Thanks, Zach. Um... And also take a look at our tech volunteering page as well. So um, now I've finished poaching people from the Living with Machines project, I am going to um, open the floor up just for any last genealogy questions. Do you have a brick wall? Are you well, don't tell us all about your brick wall because we've only got a you know, minute left before I say a serious goodbye. But, you know, is there anything that you just like a quick answer to? You just want to pick one of our... Um, people's brains on something Just give you a chance to put that in the chat now um okay well I'll start saying thank you and goodbye to everybody it's been a really enjoyable three hours that they, they have literally they've flown out of the window and away it's gone so quickly so um thank you to everyone for joining us I'd like to thank the speakers um all for the work that they've put in and for giving up their time today um our panel include the speakers, the trustees, the people who um, chipped in, moderators who are volunteers on um, my comms team. And I am so grateful for all of the help that they've given um, us this week and beyond. And of course, everybody else who's attended, thank you so much. You've all helped to make our first online conference a success. And we hope to see you next week for round two, um, a little bit late, a little bit earlier in the day for us, a little bit later in the day if you're somewhere else in the world. Um, but I'll be sending out the joining information for that um, next week at some point. Pat's going to give her update again for anybody who missed it early doors. So do hang around for that if you'd like to. Um, find out what we've been up to for the next uh, for the last couple of years and um otherwise take care of yourselves and goodbye thank you again goodbye thanks Bye. a lot denise thanks for all the work you put in as well it's oh it's i enjoyed it thank you very much for that graham yes thank you oh, you're welcome thank you all right bye everyone. thank you bye everybody bye bye Hi. Um, Pat, would you like to share your screen and give your update again? Unmute, like that helps. Uh... I feel like we should be playing elevator music. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's where we need a free BMD karaoke session or something. <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing it. <laughs> Barbershop quartet, jazz band. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Am I sharing my screen at the moment? No, you're not yet, Pat. No. Oh, let's. That's it. Hopefully that goes there. Welcome to the 2021 Free UK Genealogy Conference, or as we are repeating this presentation at the beginning and end of both sessions, 
I hope you have enjoyed the 2021 conference. A welcome and thank you to everyone who has volunteered with Free UK Genealogy as transcribers, as designers, developers and in leading the projects, as trustees and the advisory board members and as our partners, especially the speakers who are making the conference possible. A hello to those of you who already volunteer with us and hello to everyone else. You would be very welcome to join the other volunteers. Thank you also to those who have contributed to our running costs. This graph shows how this funding has increased over the last two years. A little about what's been happening in our three projects. In Free BMD, we're now transcribing the GRO indices of births, marriages and deaths in the period 1986 to 1990. The designs for a new interface for users have gone through several iterations and we have volunteers who will be testing in the next few weeks. In FreeSEN, tasks have included building replacements for all the tools for transcribers and coordinators, including the quality control roles of proofreaders and validators. We are working on improving how the censuses can be searched by place and building a gazetteer that helps identify the place in birth intended or finding that it may be ambiguous. We've made changes to our font and colours, both here on Free Sen and on the other sites, and other changes to improve accessibility. Tasks finished on Free Reg include setting up a team to liaise with record offices, moving to input from a spreadsheet that can accommodate many more types of records, improving the use of the uncertain character format which we use to indicate the level of certainty with which we can see something or nothing in the transcriptions, recording and using data permissions, for example to automate the showing of records when they age out of an embargo, and recording and reporting gaps in the sequence of registers. How you can help us keep history free? Please consider joining us as a volunteer if you don't already volunteer. Please tell other family historians that we are here. Please put us in touch with anyone we should be talking with. Please consider making a donation to our work. I'd like to thank Denise Colbert, the Engagement and Volunteering Coordinator and her team who have made this conference possible alongside much else they do to keep the organisation going. Enjoy the conference and all that Free UK Genealogy brings you.